Good evening. <clears throat> hey guys. <clears throat> Hello everybody. Hello. Welcome back. Or it's good to be back. How is everybody doing this evening? Good evening everybody. Good evening, good evening. Great to be back. I feel like it's been ages. I feel like it's been ages. Yeah, I missed you guys too. I missed you guys. Where have you guys been? What have you been up to? Fooling around? I feel like it's been ages. It's been uh, it's been about a month, right? This was early February. It's been ages. <laughs> so what have you had? You've had psych. All right, that's easy. What do you have to know about psych? You give them some pills, right? You put them and you lock them in the psych ward, right? I look, <laughs> I look sharp. I like you, Muhammad. Muhammad, you're a smart man. You are a smart man. You, you look at you. You know what you're talking about. All right, OB. Here's what you have to do in OB. Catch, right? That's it. You just stand there and you catch it, right? And if you can't, you say push, push. Anybody can do that. Push. And if that doesn't work, you cut them open. Bam. That's easy. That's OB. I just taught you OB. You're done. You guys can take your B test now. And surgery, just cut. Cut. Don't hit the artery. That's it. You're done. Don't hit the artery. Don't make them bleed. That's it. That's surgery. You pass surgery exam. That's it. There you go. Now, if you guys want to be an orthopedist, how do you become an orthopedist? Just go to the gym and work out. Right? Ah, work out. Bench press, bam, bam, you're an orthopedic surgeon, done, that's it. That's your orthopedist exam. You are an orthopedist, that's it. Go in the backyard, get a two by four and a saw, and that's it, you're an orthopedic surgeon. Carpenter, orthopedic surgeon, what is the difference? This is where it's at. This is where it's at. <laughs> nah, I can't be that easy, of course not. All right, so you guys had surgery, OB. All right, good. Well, welcome back to the real stuff now. Now we're going to have the fun material. So the um, the first half of emergency medicine is quite fun. I spend, I really get into two arrhythmias. We do narrow complex. We do wide complex. So I spend a lot of time on arrhythmias. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff we go over tonight is stuff that I see as a hospitalist. So I see these arrhythmias on, on, a, on a regular basis uh, and these are things that you will definitely see on, on the exam. Now step two doesn't get into too much detail but uh, you know what I go over tonight is, is pretty much all you need to know <clears throat> for arrhythmia. So this is going to be a very good review of arrhythmias <clears throat> for both clinical practice as well as what you're going to see on, on step two. Uh, tomorrow night <clears throat> we're going to do uh, toxicology, uh, bleeds, uh, and, uh, and animal bites, a couple of things tomorrow night. But tonight's going to be the important night. Tonight we're going to really do some fun, fun cardiology. Um, we don't have notes on this, no, but a lot of the arrhythmias are, are, in, the, are in the books, okay? So I, I, didn't, I didn't put together a note sheet on this section, okay? You ready to do this? Who's ready to do this? Let's go. All right, let's do this. You guys ready? All right, let's move along. So... As always, uh, I ask a lot of questions. Let the poll box ready. Amanda, if you have the poll box ready, we'll get, on, get that in there soon. And uh, let's do emergency medicine. All right. By the way, before we get started, uh, does anybody any want to do emergency medicine? Just out of curiosity. Sylvia, do you want to, anybody want to do emergency medicine? I'm just curious. Kavita, you want to do emergency medicine? Okay. I'm just curious. Okay. Yeah, you, okay. All right. I'm just curious. That's all. All right, just curious. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, and here we go. Let's start off with a question. Let's take a poll. Let's take a poll on this question. Eddie Moody, I like the way you think. 
the financial future of emergency medicine is secure, in my opinion. We can talk about the finance of medicine in a little bit. Let's do the question first, Eddie. I'll get back to that. I give you a little, I give you my personal perspective on that. Let's concentrate on the question. No, I'm a hospitalist, Kavita. And I'm going to, I'll give you, as we go through the lecture, I'll give you a little bit of my opinion on, um, on these specialties. Okay, so let's close the poll. Let's close the poll. <clears throat> and the answer here is D. You should call 911. Call 911. Now, you know, you never want to admit you need help, but you need help here, okay? Why do you need help here? Why is calling 911 essential here? Yes. AED defibrillator defibrillator defri now if you happen to have a defibrillator in your back pocket then you're golden but if you don't you better call 911 okay I don't have one in my back pocket okay I have a gun I'm kidding I don't have anything in my back pocket but if you have one with you that's great now if you have two people with you one person can either go for help but if you bar yourself you may be tempted to examine the patient. You may be tempted to, you know, start working on the patient. But you really need to get call for help first because, um, because if you if that patient has a shockable rhythm, you need to get a defibrillator to that patient as soon as possible. Okay, so well, yeah. I, I mean, nowadays you could you could also you know call on your cell phone, and it takes a second. But you really need to call for help before you examine the patient. So when you find somebody unresponsive. When you find somebody unresponsive, you, you better call for help first. So the first thing you should do is call for help before you do anything. Okay, so let's go through the unresponsive patient. So first thing you do is make sure they're unresponsive, right? Maybe they're taking a nap, right? Shake them, make sure they're not, you know, make sure they're not, you know, make sure they're really unresponsive. Then you call for help. Okay, that's important. You must call for help. Don't do anything until you call for help. Now, here's where it gets important because the ACLS um, algorithm has changed. In 2010, in 2010, they changed the the BLS, the basic life support, okay? And this is what we use today. And this is still in 2014. They're going to change it again in 2015, but this is still what we use here today. 2010, they made some very important changes. And here's what they, they said. Remember the old uh, the, the open the airway with the chin lift, jaw thrust? We don't do that anymore. That's been removed from the algorithm. Look. Listen and feel for breathing. Look, listen and feel for breathing. Gone. We don't do that anymore. Okay. Rescue breaths. Removed. This is important. Rescue breaths. Removed. We don't do these anymore. So here's what why we made these changes. Or I didn't make these changes. The, 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 the society made these changes because there were studies. And the outcomes of these studies showed that when you do CPR, is chest compressions. That is what's important. Chest compressions, chest compressions, chest compressions. Good quality chest compressions, early chest compression. Do not delay chest compression. So everything on the slide doesn't help your patient. Okay. The only thing that helps is chest compression. So as soon as you call for help, the next thing you're going to do is check for a pulse. Okay, so carotid is best. You're going to feel for a carotid pulse. And you're going to feel for 5 to 10 seconds. You're going to feel for a carotid pulse. If you do not feel a pulse, you're going to start chest compressions immediately. No rescue breaths. This is important. No rescue breaths. You're going to start chest compressions. You're going to do 100 chest compressions a minute. This is the emphasis of CPR, basic life support. And this is very important because studies show that when you do these rescue breaths, the rescue breaths delay chest compressions, okay? And chest compressions is what improves mortality, okay? So here's what these studies showed. A five-second delay, Sylvia, right? That's exactly right, Sylvia. Five-second delay equals 
20% reduction in mortality. Five seconds, 20%. Five seconds, 20% reduction in mortality. That's it. How long is five seconds? Count to five. 20%. How long does it take to do two rescue breaths? About five seconds. Okay, so that's a big number. Goldie go, 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 go said six seconds. Depends on how slow you are. <laughs> Depends on how fast you do the seconds. Yeah, it could, could even be more than five seconds. Depends on how, yeah, it could even be more than five seconds. Okay, so this is, you know, this is the stuff they'll test you on. Okay, this is, this is, you know, if you guys take a, an ACLS course, they'll tell you this as well. Okay, this is very important. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Kavita, I think they're getting carried away. I don't think it takes that long. But bottom line is they, it wastes time. Okay, you, you, you guys are exactly right. It wastes time. So we have to, we cannot, we, you don't do them. So now you can do 30 chest compressions. Okay, 30 chest compressions. Now, there's there's two options here. Uh, you guys ever hear of... Um, Compressions only. Some people are advocates of compressions only. You guys heard of this? You guys heard of compressions only? Yeah, some people say you can do chest compressions only. Uh, some say you do 30 chest compressions and then do two breaths. You can do either or. Okay, so the exam can't ask you that. They're both. They're both. They're both. They're both okay. Um, but what is definitely what is definitely out is the look, listen, and feel for breathing. What is definitely out is what we call the two rescue breaths because that is done before you start the chest compression and that delays the chest compression. So the look, listen, and feel and the two rescue breaths is the is 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 out. That's out. Okay, so you just go right for the pulse. So 911 pulse chest compressions, 30 chest compressions, and then you can give two breaths. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, Eric, you may have an old version of the book. I'm not sure what you have. The, the new version, um, the new version doesn't say that, and I know that because I wrote the new version. So you may have an older version. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, of course, think about causes. If someone's in cardiac arrest, think about the causes. Uh, you have cardiac, neurological, and toxic uh, toxicological causes. So again, the new emphasis is on chest compressions. Okay. So. Uh, quality chest compressions, the depth, the depth of the chest compressions is five centimeters or two inches. Okay, these are things that they may ask you, so you should know this. You want to do five centimeter chest compressions. Okay, and shocking is very important too. We'll get back to that in a second. Okay. Now here's something else they may ask you. Okay, <clears throat> you're doing chest compressions, right? You're charging the defibrillator. What do you do, or what should be done while you're charging the defibrillator? <clears throat> what happens while you're charging the defibrillator? It's a simple question, but it's important. Very good, Kavita. You continue chest compression. So you can't do emergency medicine. There you go. Continue chest compressions, okay? Because how long does it take to charge the uh, defibrillator? About five seconds, okay? Five seconds. So continue chest compressions. And that may be a question. Why? Because it improves mortality. Goldie says six seconds. Goldie has a slower defibrillator. Goldie has a slow. <laughs> Goldie needs a new defibrillator. Someone's there's something wrong with Goldie's defibrillator. <laughs> she gives slower breaths, slower defibrillators. I don't know, Goldie. What was going on with you? Okay, so um, that may be a question too. It's a simple question, but it may be a question. So, so if if you if you charge your defibrillator, continue chest compressions. Okay. The next thing you may see is have you guys heard of the hypothermia protocol? Who's heard of this here? Anybody heard of the, the hypothermia protocol? Just curious. Anybody heard of the hypothermia protocol? Jose has. Okay. Most people haven't. Jennifer has. Okay, good. So Jennifer, you you've you've seen this in the intensive care unit, right? This is where they use it. So if, if a patient survives cardiac arrest, um, they go into the ICU. Okay. They go into the ICU. Um, this is if you survive. If if the if you do not survive, just to be clear, guys, if you do not survive, then you don't go to the ICU and you don't do the hypothermic protocol because they're already hypothermic, right? That's that's an easy one. If you don't survive, there's no reason to do this because they're already hypothermic. But if they do survive, you do what we call the hypothermia protocol, okay? And what that is is you you put a, a cooling blanket, you put a cooling blanket on their body, on the core, and you want to get the core body temperature. 
you want to get the core body temperature down to 32 to 34 degrees Celsius within six hours, and you want to keep it there, okay? You want to keep it there for 12 to 24 hours, okay? And um, Jose, you, you guys, are, and Jennifer, the guys that have seen this, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? Aside to be really cool. Hope your attendings taught you why they were doing this, and I just did it. Yes, but what's the clinical outcome? What's the clinical outcome? Yeah, they get a they get a, an improvement in neurological. So studies show uh, there's an improvement in neurological outcome, morbidity. Exactly, Miles, morbidity because patients that that have cardiac arrest they get an oxygen brain injury. And if you get an oxygen brain injury, you have very poor neurological outcome. They act like me, right? You don't want them to act like me, right? They have poor, poor thinking, poor cognitive, poor cognition, right? This is what happens when you, when you have cardiac arrest. You don't want that. So, so the hypothermia protocol improves the neurological outcome, meaning they may recover some neurological ability, okay? And that's why we do the hypothermia protocol, okay? Cognitive ability. They get, they get improved in their cognition, okay? neurological outcome okay so that's why we do it okay okay next question ready let's take a poll on the next question next question They're coming. <coughs> there you go. Yes, brief. F is what you'll be doing next year. Okay, so we'll close the poll now. The answer is C. The answer is C, epinephrine. The answer is C, epinephrine. Okay, so let me just tell you a quick story before I answer this question. When I was a resident, uh, I did my residency at Mount Sinai in Manhattan. Um, one, of my, one of my co residents told me a story about when she was an intern, she had an unstable patient, kind of like this, and she was running around trying to find her resident for help. She couldn't find her resident. So she runs into the, <clears throat> into, the, into the call room, and she sees a resident in the call room. She sees a res her resident in the call room flipping through a textbook because the resident has no clue what to do. She's sitting there trying to, like, feverishly sweating, flipping through the book, trying to figure out what's going on. So it's pretty scary when, 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 you're, when you see patients crashing and you're, you're, you're the guy, you're going to go to guy, at least in the beginning. Then you get used to it, and you figure it out. You know, once you have experience like me, it's no big deal. Because then you figure out, when you're at my point, you figure out either you can do something about it or you can't the best right okay so let's go through the question uh, oh jennifer hold on <clears throat> uh, i haven't uh i haven't seen it um but um you know usually you, you see that with hypothermia I, I haven't seen it but i guess it makes sense you can't see it though <clears throat> okay so um the patient's unresponsive 
patients are responsive and you do not feel a pulse. So pulseless, okay? Unresponsive and pulseless. Now, what do you see in this rhythm script? So let's look at the rhythm script. What do you see here? Okay, so here's your P wave. Uh, here's your QRS wave. Uh, here's your T wave. Okay, so what do you see here? It's sinus, Jennifer. But what do you notice about the rate? Very slow. So the rhythm strip shows you sinus bradycardia. Okay, the rhythm strip shows you narrow complex, narrow complex, sinus brady. So this is sinus bradycardia. Look how far apart the QRS is, right? The R to R interval, right? The R to R interval tells you your heart rate, correct? The R to R interval tells you your heart rate. The R to R interval here is massively far apart. So this is bradycardic. I mean, the heart rate is, I'm not going to count it, but it's probably about 20. But here's the key. So you see narrow complex, right? And, and pulseless. So what do we call this rhythm? Do not feel a pulse. Pulseless. What do you call this rhythm? Very good, Davin. This is PEA arrest, pulseless electrical activity, okay? So the answer is epinephrine. The answer is epinephrine. So when you talk about the ACLS protocol, you have your shockable rhythms, you have your shockable rhythms, and you have your non-shockable rhythms, and you have to know the difference. Asystole and PEA arrest is the same thing. Asystole is PEA arrest. PEA arrest is asystole. It is the same thing. Okay, asystole is it's flat line. Okay, I'm sure you know what asystole is. Almost look, almost look like asystole. We're going to see something like I just showed you, right? Sinus bradycardia, and it may be narrow complex. Okay, maybe wide complex, but you're going to see a couple of little little QRS complexes far apart. That's PA arrest. It's asystole. It's the same thing. These are non-shockable rhythms. You're not going to feel a pulse. These are non-shockable rhythms. So what do you do? Chest compressions, chest compressions, chest compressions. Okay. Well, it doesn't make a difference, really. So so the point is, Rick, is that you're not feeling a pulse. And what you can see is, you see, the, the, the machine can pick up, you can see some electrical activity. Right, you can see some electrical activity, but there's no pulse. So what this tells me is you're picking up electrical activity, but the heart is not contracting. How do you know it's not contracting? Because there's no pulse. So you could pick up some electrical activity on the rhythm strip, and that's what you're seeing here. So so your heart is is there's a little electrical activity, and it could be narrow complex or wide complex. It doesn't make a difference for this for this talk. It doesn't make a difference. But the point is is that there's no pulse. So so there's no contraction. So there's no cardiac output. Okay, so your patient's in trouble. Okay, and you know there's no cardiac output because there's no pulse. Okay, so you could be saying narrow complex or wide complex, doesn't make a difference. But you, you'll see something like this, like narrow complex, wide complex, and it will be far apart. It's not going to be tachycardic, right? Because we'll talk about that in a second. So this is this is PA rest. So you're going to do CPR and you're going to give epinephrine. Now you're going to give epinephrine uh, three times, okay, one milligram every three to five minutes. Uh, you can replace epinephrine with what? If you don't want to give epinephrine because you, you're on strike against epinephrine, what can you give? I'm on strike against epinephrine. Yeah, vasopressin. But what do you have to know about vasopressin? What's different? You give it once. Yeah, so if you give vasopressin, you give it once, right? So you give vasopressin. If you give vasopressin, you give one shot of vasopressin. And then three to five minutes later, you give epinephrine. Okay, one shot of vasopressin, and then three to five minutes later, you give epinephrine. Okay, atropine has been removed from the algorithms. So we used to give atropine. In 2010, we said atropine is not necessary. So we no longer give atropine. That's another change that was made in 2010. So epinephrine, 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 or vasopressin, epinephrine, epinephrine. Okay. Then... Now, you know, I put this question here, but I really think everybody should really get bicarb, okay? At some point, you're going to get bicarb. But what's the point of the bicarbonate? Why are we giving bicarb? Why are we giving bicarb? Yeah, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in asystole or PARS for more than 10 minutes, 
you will develop a lactic acidosis. So you, you're going to get bicarb anyway. Okay, so you will have a lactic acidosis. So we get bicarb at this point anyway. Okay, but you know the real reason to get bicarb is to treat an underlying acidosis or to treat what else? What other disorder? You know, let's say you find a guy in the street. You know nothing about this guy. Nothing. Okay, what is what is bicarb treating that you have no clue of? That maybe he has and this may help you. An acidosis. Um, uh, okay, maybe ask an overdose. Uh, not DKA. We don't use bicarb for DKA. Yeah, you got it, Reka. Hyperkalemia. The answer is hyperkalemia. Renal failure and hyperkalemia. So who gets hyperkalemia? Renal failure patients. Okay. So if this is your cell, right, if this is your cell, remember 98% of your body's potassium is inside the cell. We can say 98%, okay, is inside your cell. Okay. So <clears throat> let's say you have hyperkalemia for whatever reason. Okay. So by the way, why is hyperkalemia so dangerous? And, you know, how come if, if you have hypernatremia or, or high chloride levels, why is that not dangerous to you? Yeah, but why does it cause arrhythmias? Why doesn't high sodium or high chloride cause arrhythmias? If this is your cardiac cell, these are myocytes. I just drew a myocyte. What is so special? What is so special? Safi, you're good. Ungated potassium channels. Your myocytes, your ventricular cells, very good, have ungated potassium channels, right? And usually potassium effluxes in a normal day. It effluxes. Well, hyperkalemia can actually cause an influx of potassium, and that can depolarize a resting cell, and that can excite a cell, and that can cause you to go into a ventricular tachycardia. So that's why it's so dangerous. <clears throat> okay, so. <clears throat> If this is a cell, not a myocyte, this is a cell elsewhere in your body, right? <clears throat> you have hyperkalemia. The treatment is bicarbonate. So by giving bicarbonate, bicarbonate will bind to extracellular protons, right? Bicarbonate will bind to extracellular protons. And that will lead to a decrease in extracellular proton concentration. And what that will do is cause protons to shift out of the cell. In order to maintain electron neutrality, potassium will shift inside your cells. So what bicarb does is cause these transcellular shifts because it creates an it creates an <clears throat> it, it creates an alkalosis and it causes protons to shift out of the cell, and then it causes potassium to shift inside the cell. And it shows potassium inside cells very quickly. And it treats hyperkalemia. So, so that's why we give bicarbonate to these patients. Okay, so in, if somebody has PA rest or, or asystole, we give bicarbonate to treat hyperkalemia. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let me take let me you know take a step back for a second. Um, let's say I have a patient who uh, walks in with this CKG. What do you see in a CKG, and what do you do about it? Right, you see PT waves? One of my residents, when I was an intern, told me a PT wave looks like something you don't want to sit on. Right? So when you see this, and this patient's not an asystole, obviously, then it's good. The first thing you do is give calcium gluconate. Now, why is why calcium gluconate? What does calcium gluconate? Good. It stabilizes the cardiac membranes. It stabilizes the cardiac membrane. So that's the first thing you do to protect the heart. It doesn't affect the potassium at all, at all. But it stabilizes the cardiac membrane. So that's the first thing you do. Okay. Now, let me ask you. If you do not give calcium gluconate and treat this patient immediately, what happens next to the EKG? What would you see on the EKG next after this? Before, yeah, before that, you see QT prolongation, and yes, that's it. You got it, guys. Everything gets wide. Everything gets wide. Not you, wave Jennifer. That's hypokalemia. So you see this. This is hyperkalemia. Wide in QRS. So this is wide in QRS. Notice the PT waves are still peaked. You still see PT waves, but now look at that QRS. 
widen QRS, widen QRS, PT waves, widen QRS, widen QRS, PT waves, widen QRS, okay? This guy's in trouble. That's right, Rika. That's right, Rika. The answer is, wow. You see, there's certain things you see when you're practicing medicine. You look at something and you say, holy crap. When you see this, you say, holy crap. So this definitely gets calcium gluconate, okay? Because this will then progress into sine waves. And then, now, you know, this can go into either asystole or VTAC. You can go anywhere, okay, after this. So you go to sine waves, asystole or VTAC. You can go anywhere. But it's, it's going to end into trouble, okay? So, um, so that's how you, that's what you see in EKG. So calcium gluconate. So let's go back to my cell here. So bicarbonate will help push potassium inside the cell. What else do we give these patients? What else will move potassium inside cells? What else? How else do we treat hyperkalemia? It's very good, Miles. So remember your sodium potassium ATPase. Sodium potassium ATP will split. We'll split ATP, hydrolyze ATP to actively pump potassium inside cells and pump sodium outside cells. Remember that for physiology? Well, insulin activates this pump. Insulin activates the sodium potassium ATPase. So when you give insulin, you activate the sodium potassium ATPase and you shove potassium inside cells. Don't forget when you give insulin, what else should you give? Give dextrose, right? Give it to them without dextrose, you're going to get to trouble. So make sure you get dextrose as well. Okay. What else? What else can help you here? Should you give insulin? What else can you give? Very good. k -exalate. What is k -exalate? What is k -exalate? How does that work? All right. Chelates. Okay. It's a potassium chelator. Okay. It's a polystyrene. Sodium, right? Sodium polystyrene sulfate. We have to use generic names for step two. Okay, step two, we use generic names. Sodium polystyrene sulfate <clears throat> binds potassium in the intestines and it gives you diarrhea. So you have to tell people, I'm going to give you diarrhea, but it's going to prevent you from dying. So you either get, I actually told the patient that once. She didn't want it because it gave her diarrhea. So I said, You get diarrhea or you have a fatal arrhythmia. I don't want diarrhea. I said, You get diarrhea or you die. So that's how you that's what you do. Uh, you also give beta agonist. Beta agonist. Somebody said beta blockers. Be careful. It's not beta blockers, it's the opposite. You give beta agonist, okay? Maybe beta agonist, okay? Because that'll also push the potassium inside uh, the cells, okay? So beta agonist, okay? Okay, so this is how you treat hyperkalemia. And then dialysis, of course. You eventually give uh, dialysis. That's important. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. So who gets hyperkalemia? Let's talk about, I'm going to take a step back. You guys know that, you know, renal failure, of course. Who else? Who else gets hyperkalemia? Renal failure is the most common. Who else? Crush injuries. DKA, but yeah, but DKA, remember, you have low potassium inside cells, so eventually, right, that's true. Who else? CHF, um, not really. Tumor lysis syndrome, absolutely. Rhabdo, absolutely. Potassium spare diuretics. So anything that inhibits the RAS system. So, you know, this is important because... You know, about about a year ago, I had a guy that came in. Um, I had a guy that came in um, with uh, with a potassium of, of eight, and my resident treated him properly. She gave insulin, she gave dextrose, she gave bicarb, she gave caxalate, and the patient did okay. Then she said, "Let's discharge him," and I said, "Well, why was the potassium eight? You have to look for a cause." And she said, "Well, um, I don't know." And I said, "Well, you know." Whenever a patient comes in with a problem, the very first thing you should do is look at their medication list, right? And I looked at the medication list, and what was this patient on? He 
he was on lisinopril. Anything that inhibits the RAS system. So you have alaskiron. What is alaskiron? What's alaskiron? Right, renin receptor inhibitor. Now that we use for hypertension, right? Then you have ACE inhibitors, right? ACE inhibitors inhibit ACE. And then we have ARBs, right? ARBs are angiotensin II receptor blockers. And then we have spironolactone. And a plerinone, okay? So anything that inhibits the RAS system, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, spironolactone, alaskirin, anything that blocks the RAS system can lead to hyperkalemia. We call this a type 4 renal tubular acidosis. We call this a type 4. This is what we call a type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Another word for this is hypoaldosterone. <clears throat> what does aldosterone do? Yeah, you need aldosterone. You need aldosterone to secrete potassium. So two things, I always say two things will give you hyperkalemia. So you need two things that have no potassium. You need kidneys and you need aldosterone. You need kidneys and you need aldosterone. You need kidneys and you need aldosterone. So you're going to see hyperkalemia. You're going to see hyperkalemia in two situations. When you have no kidneys and when you have no aldosterone. So these are drugs. Drugs can do this. Okay. Drugs can do this. So this is what we call hypoaldosterone. We call this a type 4 renal tubular acidosis. This is a type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Okay. Type 4 RTA is a hypoaldosterone state. Okay. Who else gets this? We think it's another important one. Where does aldosterone come from? Adrenal glands. So how about Addison's disease? Addison's disease. Addison's disease is a primary hypoaldosteronism or primary adrenal insufficiency. So Addison's disease, Addison's disease is primary adrenal insufficiency. Addison's disease is primary adrenal insufficiency. It's an autoimmune disease. It's an autoimmune disease that destroys the entire adrenal gland. Zona glomerulosa, which is where aldosterone comes from, reticulata fasciculata, so you have low cortisol, low aldosterone, low cortisol, low aldosterone. That's Addison's disease. Yes. waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome is an acute Addisonian crisis, hemorrhaging. Acute hemorrhaging into both of your adrenal glands. They come up with an adrenal crisis. It's due to meningitis, right? So the organism is meningitis, Neisseria meningitis, and they can get DIC too. They have DIC, Neisseria meningitis. Very, very good. Okay? Neisseria meningitis is the organism. It gives you DIC and, and a, a, acute. They come in with shock. They come in with shock. They're, they're hypotensive. They're in trouble. Uh, it can be because the adrenal glands just get, you just lose your adrenal glands like that, so you get low of everything, okay? You get hemorrhaging into the adrenal glands, and you have low aldosterone, low cortisol, salt-wasting crisis. Uh, it's, it's a medical emergency. You have to give steroids immediately, okay? Addison's disease. Now, I, I want to, you know, this is not endocrine, so I'm getting into too much detail, but I want to give you one important point. In secondary adrenal insufficiency, the problem is the pituitary gland, which is up here, and those patients have low ACTH, right? And what controls release of aldosterone from the adrenal glands? What controls release of aldosterone from the adrenal glands? Is it ACTH? One question, yes or no? No, it is angiotensin II. So here's my question. If a woman has Sheehan syndrome, this is a classic question. You better be ready for this. You better be ready for this. If a woman has Sheehan syndrome, is she going to have hyperkalemia? The answer is no way, Jose. 
because ACTH is low, cortisol is low, sure. But what controls aldosterone? Not ACTH. Renin, angiotensin 2, RAS. So as long as you have kidneys, right, renin, angiotensin 2, and you have aldosterone, your potassium is just fine. Will she have hyperpigmentation? This is classic. Everybody gets this wrong. Will she have hyperpigmentation? No, because her ACTH will be low, 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 not high. Addison's will have hyperpigmentation because loss of negative feedback inhibition of cortisol. ACTH goes through the roof and you get dark. Okay. So these are important questions. I went off the cuff a little bit. One more cause of, of, of hyperkalemia or, or type 4 RTA is in, in diabetic nephropathy. Right? Diabetic nephropathy, you get a low retin state, or you can see this. So when people have diabetic nephropathy, remember, the kidneys secrete renin, right? So if your kidneys are not working so great, if your kidneys are failing, you get low renin and it leads to low aldo. And that leads to hyperkalemia. So these are all the cases where you see hyperkalemia, okay? These are the cases where you see hyperkalemia, okay? So this is a type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Low aldosterone states. Okay, these are low aldosterone states. That's where you see hyperkalemia. You see hyperkalemia without aldosterone. So these are the drugs and conditions that can cause hyperkalemia. Okay, these are the conditions where you can see hyperkalemia. Now, uh, you know, if you're on a drug, you just stop it, for example. But if you have Addison's disease, you have to replace the aldosterone, right? If you're missing it, you give, how do you replace aldosterone? What's the drug that replaces aldosterone? Spironolactone um, will, will inhibit aldosterone, remember? You get fludro cortisone. Good guys. Fludro. Fludro cortisone replaces. So you get in fludro cortisone, right? That's what you get for Addison's disease. You get fludro cortisone. So that's how you replace the aldosterone. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's where you see <clears throat> hyperkalemia. So I kind of went off the uh, cuff a little bit, but I think that's important. Okay, so these are important EKGs. Uh, where do you see U wave? Where do you see U wave? Yeah, hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. So, so now let's talk about hypokalemia. So, where do you see hypokalemia? Very good. So, uh, and you know, remember aldosterone. Aldosterone gets rid of potassium. So, and now it's the opposite, right? You could see it in high aldosterone states, right? High aldosterone states, which includes primary, which includes Con syndrome, right? So that's a classic endocrine question. You have a young young guy, a twenty five year old guy comes in with hypertension and hypokalemia, right? You expect to see what low renin, high aldo. That's contadrome. Okay. Then you have secondary, right? Then you have secondary hyperaldosteronism, which is what you guys are already saying it, right? Renal artery stenosis, right? That's one cause of secondary. Uh, and then anybody that, that's hypervolemic, so CHF, right? So, so CHF or, or, or cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome, those are cases where you have your, your volume shifts from the intravascular space into the, into the we call it the the interstitial space, and that stimulates renin release, right, from the kidney. So now you have your kidneys here, right, your kidney sensing low pressure, and you have a high renin state, right? So low intravascular volume leads to high renin, leads to high aldo, and all these conditions can give you low potassium states. It's called secondary, secondary hyperaldosteronism. So that can give you low potassium states. Uh, you guys are saying loop diuretics and thighs are diuretics, it's very common. Okay, loop diuretics, thighs are diuretics. Barter syndrome, which is when the when the sodium potassium two chloride channels 
are not functioning, so that's just like being on a loop diuretic. Gittleman syndrome, which is when the sodium chloride channels are not functioning, so that's just like being on a thiazide diuretic, okay? And then, of course, vomiting, whether it's bulimia nervosa or just gastroenteritis. So vomiting, diarrhea. So you have GI losses, like vomiting, diarrhea. And then you have renal losses. You have renal losses, right? Like loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, uh, Gittleman syndrome. There's, there's many different reasons. So renal losses. So diuretics are the, are the big one, though, right? Diuretics are a big cause. So loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, okay? And then you have your distal and proximal RTAs, right? So you have your type 4 RTA, which gives you hyperkalemia, but the other RTAs, which are the distal and proximal RTAs, they also give you hypokalemia too. So that's important to remember too, right? So the distal RTA and the proximal RTAs, they also give you hypokalemia, okay? Uh, and then you have malnourishment, like alcoholics, commonly alcoholics, or, you know, elderly patients that are not eating, right? So so malnourishment, okay? Anorexics, so people that are not, are not eating properly, okay? So that's what gets hypokalemia. Now, hypokalemia can also cause arrhythmias as well, okay? So it's just as important to treat and you just replete it. Okay, so it causes a PA arrest, uh, NA systole. You have your H's, hypoxia. Hyperhypokalemia, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hypovolemia. Trauma, you have your T's, trauma, trauma toxins, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, uh, and thrombosis. Okay, and those are your causes of ACEs and PA arrest. Okay, so let's do the next question. Okay, so we'll close the poll now. So the answer here is A, unsynchronized shock. This is a high yield question. What do you see on this rhythm trip? What's the diagnosis? Good, good, Reka. This is ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation. So it's wide complex. And it's completely chaotic, okay? Why complex and it's complete chaos. It's complete chaos, complete disorganization, okay? So this is ventricular tachycardia, okay? Now, when you shock, okay, let's talk about shocking for a minute. There are two different types of shock. There's synchronized and there's unsynchronized. So what does synchronized mean? Well, when you, when you give a patient a <clears throat> synchronized shock, Right when you look at the defibrillator, there's actually a switch. You can switch. You can go to synchronized or unsynchronized. But what that means is this: <clears throat> when you give a synchronized shock, you're synchronizing that shock to the QRS complex. Okay, you're synchronizing that shock to the QRS complex. And what does QRS mean? What what happens during the QRS? When you look in the EKG and you see the QRS, what is happening? Your ventricular is depolarizing and contracting, right? You have what we call excitation contraction coupling. As the ventricle is 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 depolarizing, it's contracting, right? So if you look at your ventricular <clears throat> action potential, remember this? Guys have nightmares about this. <clears throat> phase four, <clears throat> phase zero, phase two, phase one, phase three. And phase four, ah, it's not that bad, come on. So if you compare this to the EKG, right, here's your QRS, 
here's your T wave. <clears throat> the QRS is right here. What phase does the QRS coincide with? What determines the QRS? It's phase zero. Phase zero determines the QRS. Okay, phase zero. So phase zero is when is when the ventricular cell is depolarizing. And when the ventricular cell is depolarizing, that's the QRS. Now, as sodium, <clears throat> excuse me, this is because sodium channels are opening. So your sodium channels are opening, the fast sodium channels are opening. As your fast sodium channels are opening, sodium rushes inside the cell, and the cell rapidly depolarizes. At the same time, your L-type calcium channels are opening, and they stay open, and that gives you phase two. So as they stay open, calcium is rushing inside the cell, potassium is going out to, to balance it out, and that's what gives you phase two. Okay. Now, as that calcium moves inside the cell, you have what's called calcium-induced calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That calcium binds to troponin and causes contraction. So this is excitation contraction coupling. So as the ventricular cells are depolarizing, they are contracting, and that's what's happening during the QRS. So if there's no if there's no QRS, there's no contraction. So these cells, the heart is not depolarizing. The heart is not contracting. So when you give a synchronized shock, you're synchronizing that shock with the QRS. Okay. This heart has no QRS. This heart is not contracting. So you can cannot not deliver this patient a synchronized shock. It's impossible. Okay, so if you have the pads on the patient's chest and you're trying to deliver a synchronized shock, it's not going to happen. Okay, it will not deliver the shock because there is nothing to synchronize the shock with. You cannot give a synchronized shock to this patient because the heart is not contracting. So another word for the unsynchronized is what? What's another word for unsynchronized? Yeah, defib. So you just defibrillate. So another word for unsynchronized shock is defibrillation. Okay. Another word for uh, unsynchronized shock. Another word for unsynchronized shock is defibrillation. So unsynchronized shock is defibrillation same thing it's interchangeably so you have to give this patient with the fib a defibrillation or an unsynchronized shock because there's nothing to synchronize the shock to and that's very important because you cannot deliver it otherwise okay so v fib gives you an unorganized pattern you give an unsynchronized shock now biphasic and monophasic doesn't make much of a difference. Here's what it means. If you have your two pairs on the patient's chest, if you have your two pairs in the patient's chest, monophasic means that the shock goes from one pair to the next, right? Biphasic means it goes from one pair to the next and then back. That's what biphasic means. And because that happens, it allows you to give lower voltage. And it's better to give lower voltage because it gives you less burns on the chest. Okay, so that's why it's better. So monophasic is, is better. Okay, so I'm sorry, mon biphasic is better. Excuse me, biphasic is better because it's less shock. Um, Rekha, cardioversion is synchronized. Yes, Jose, you're correct. Uh, cardioversion is synchronized. So so defibrillation is unsynchronized, cardioversion is synchronized. So we're going to talk about synchronized a little later, but when you say cardioversion, is giving a synchronized shock, and that's an important difference, okay? Okay, so... You're going to deliver an unsynchronized shock, okay? Now, here's where it gets important. We're going to go through the, the, the order. What do you do the second after you deliver that unsynchronized shock? Anybody? Go get a beer? Who wants to go get a beer? Go right back to CPR. Go right back to CPR, and that's important, okay? Because five-second delay... 20% mortality. So get right back. Okay, so they'll give you questions on the exam, and they'll say, you know, you just delivered a shock, and here's a common distractor. Check pulse. That's wrong. One of the options will say, you just delivered a shock. The next step is check pulse. Wrong. Wrong. You have to give chest compressions, okay? 
Um, you know, when you shock somebody, it's going to take uh, several seconds for the heart to recover anyway. So if you check a pulse, you're not going to feel a pulse anyway, number one. Number two, you want to, you want to give them the chest compressions anyway. You don't want to have that delay. You want to get right back to the chest compressions, okay? So don't check a pulse. Go right back to the chest compressions. You're going to deliver chest compressions for two minutes. Now you stop and check your pulse. Five to ten seconds. That's it. No pulse. Shock again. Now when you check here, what could commonly happen is they could be in asystole. If they're in asystole, what do you do next? If the question tells you, you check the rhythm, the patient's in asystole, what's the next step? Give epinephrine. Okay, do not shock. It's asystole, right? Epinephrine. Good. Okay, so but if they're still in, in V fib, you shock again. So what do you do right after that shock? Resume CPR, right? Right after that shock, go right back to CPR. Okay, you shock, go right back to CPR. Now, so I should put CPR here, right back to CPR. Now as you're doing CPR, you're going to give epinephrine. Okay, as you're doing CPR, you're going to give epinephrine and vas or vasopressin. Okay, you're going, to give, you're going to give epinephrine or vasopressin. The reason for this is theoretically, giving epinephrine or vasopressin will improve the chances of the third shock working. The patient got two shocks already. So theoretically, it will improve the chances of the third shock working. That's why you're doing this, okay? And then you get a shock again, okay? Shock again. So, so when you look at your shocks, let me use the whiteboard, it's easier. So, what just happened? So, you're going to shock right away. Right back to CPR. Right here, shock number one. Shock number one, right back to CPR. Check a pulse, okay? If you're still, right, you check a pulse here. If you're still in VFib, of course, shock again. Always after the shock, you always go right back to CPR. Go right back to CPR. Now, you start CPR, and then you give epinephrine or vaso as you're doing CPR. You see? So this is, you do multiple things at once, okay? And then you check the pulse again. Check the pulse again. All right, so here's, here's shock number two. Right here's shock number two. If they're still in V-fib, then you shock again. There's shock number three. Right after shock number three, right back to CPR. That's important. Right back to CPR. Right back to CPR. Now, as you're doing CPR this time, you're going to give amiodarone. Right? This time, you're going to give amiodarone as you're doing CPR. Okay? And then, check the pulse. And when I say pulse, I mean rhythm too. You're going to check a rhythm too. Check a pulse or rhythm. And shock again. And now this is your fourth shock. Okay, so shock one, right back to CPR. Check your pulse. Shock two, right back to CPR. In between shock two and three, you're going to start medication. Epinephrine. Right? Give epinephrine. Then shock three, right back to CPR. Now between shock three and shock four, you're going to give amiodarone, okay? And each time you're doing CPR, CPR is for two minutes, okay? Each time you're doing CPR here, two minutes of CPR, right? Each time you're doing CPR, it's for two minutes. Each time you're doing CPR, it's for two minutes, okay? Two minutes of CPR, okay? All right, after the fourth shock, then what do you do?
Then you get a piece of pie. Time for a cup of coffee. Now you call the resident and freak out. Okay, so when you're doing this code, don't forget, you know, there's there's multiple people in the room. You're not doing this by yourself, right? So I'm saying, you know, you're doing CPR, giving up and effort at the same time, but you're not alone, right? There's either you're at a hospital or you're, you're even if you're on the street, you're having your best there, right? You have the equipment, you have several EMTs. So there's one person that runs the code, right? There's a code runner, and the code runner is saying, okay, you're bagging the patient. By the way, some at some point in here, at anywhere. You're going to intubate the patient as well. I should put that in there too. And that an input because that can happen at any point. Whenever somebody's there, at some point you're going to intubate the patient too. Okay? And that doesn't matter where, but at some point you're going to intubate. So you bag the patient, you do chest compressions, you get IV access, you push medications, you give me a back rub, you give me a foot rub, you get me a cup of coffee. And that's what the cold runner does. fun running a code. Okay, and that is how that's the, the that's the um uh bag is the is bagging when you when in the movies you put a you put a mask over the patient's face and you give them and you, and you bag them. Yeah, so we have to shock for it's not really clear what you do. So we usually call it quits. That's when you. Uh, that's when you say any objections. There's never objections. It's like at a wedding, right? At a wedding, are there ever objections at the wedding? The ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriends are all sitting there biting their tongues, right? Just like at a wedding, there's never objections because the family's outside the room. Atropine's not using any system because studies show it didn't help. Well, Alejandro, you know, the three epinephrines, that was for a different protocol, right? That was for uh, asystole and PARS, right? There's only one round of epinephrine here. This, that was a different protocol, okay? Um, you know, after the fourth shot, you could do CPR for about two more minutes, and then you should stop. Why don't we put in cold? What do you mean by cold? Hypothermia? Are you talking about hypothermia, Raker? Um, you know, we only do hypothermia if they survive. So the hypothermia protocol is done if they survive, right? So, you know, let's say after the fourth shock, the patient survives, that's when you would induce the hypothermia protocol. That's if they survive. Right? If they don't survive, then, then you know, you, you don't do anything. Um, the epinephrine theoretically, theoretically improves the chance of the next shock working. So two shocks didn't work. If we give epinephrine, maybe the third shock will work. That's why we give epinephrine. But, you know, it's, it's, there's not a lot of data for this, by the way. There's no, there's no randomized clinical trials of epinephrine using epinephrine or amiodarone versus not using them. You have to realize that. This is just what the protocols are, okay? Diane Brown, uh, after the fourth shock, we don't, after the fourth shock, we don't give any medication. The medic <laughs> after the fourth shock, we we uh, we pray. Yes, you don't have to know dosages for I do assembly step two. Don't worry about the dosage. They will not ask you dosages on the exam. Lidocaine is um. Lidocaine is uh, sometimes used, yes. Um, we do sometimes use lidocaine. Um, it's it's not used in this in this protocol. I'll, I'll actually get to lidocaine a little bit later. It's usually it's used in VTAC more. Uh, but usually you usually use it in VTAC. It is still used, yeah. Sometimes it's used. You can use it in place of amiodarone. Again, there's no data. Um, this is what we use. There's really no data for one over the other.
Uh, the epinephrine is just the, the idea behind the epinephrine asystole is to try and jumpstart the, the S8 node and to get it to, to you know, because remember, when it, it's epinephrine uh, is, you know, is, is like sympathetic drive to the heart, right? It's kind of like it will activate beta-1 receptors. So it's kind of like it'll kind of like try and uh, activate the, the, the beta-1 receptors in the S8 node to kick them to start, you know, start firing action potentials again, right? That's the idea of epinephrine because... Remember, your, your sympathetic nervous system secretes norepinephrine and some epinephrine. So, so it, these are catecholamines. So the idea behind catecholamines is to bind to uh, beta-1 receptors in the SA node and to kind of get the SA node to start firing action potentials again, like it's supposed to, right? And that's the idea behind epinephrine, and that's why we use epinephrine. <laughs> oh, we'll get to MAG a little bit later, to be honest. Honest, I have a question with Mac, so I'm not going to tell you because then I'll give away the answer and then you all get it right. You can't have that. Why is amiodarone used here? Because that's what the guidelines say. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. Let's go for a 10 minute break.
Okay. So let's get back to the class slides and we're back. Okay. We having fun yet? Anybody? Anybody having fun? We have pulses. Maybe we should feel feel for a pulse. I want everybody to do this. Feel for a carotid pulse. Make sure you have a pulse. Miles is having fun. <laughs> if, if you don't feel a pulse, call 911. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anybody in New York? I remember last time there were some people in New York. Anybody in New York in this class? Jose, you're in Jersey, the wasteland. All right. The wasteland we call Jersey. Ah, right, Lexi, you're in Jersey. Brooklyn. Cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Jose, I had to go there. What part of Brooklyn? Garden State. Yeah. What what highway are you off of? You know what stinks about Jersey is if you, if you if you miss your exit, you're stuck on the highway for about ten miles. You have to go through six more tolls. Hate Jersey. Oh, Kavita, you're in Jersey too. Oh, Kavita, you're oh, you're off the Bell Parkway. Oh, you're in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Like, what's exit eleven nine? I don't know exits. What what part of Brooklyn is that? Oh, Flatbush. All right, cool. Don't get shot. All right, cool. Nice. So you want to do emergency medicine? Okay. <laughs> All right. So let me tell you my my views on on the financial aspect of emergency medicine. The future for of medicine is to is to be employed. Uh, to be employed by a hospital. So that means what I do, which is a hospitalist. Uh, if you do emergency medicine, you're employed by a hospital, so that's safe. Um, but private practice is dead. Um, guys that are in private practice, we call them dinosaurs. Private practice is a dying is a dying breed. Um, people in private practice, it's 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 just it's falling apart. Um, there's many reasons. I don't want to get into it too much, but insurance companies don't want to pay. So if you order tests for your for your patients, insurance companies won't pay you. Obamacare is really cutting back on what private practitioners are making. Um, plus, Jose, you said it. I mean, guys in private practice, they work long days, and, and the overhead is massive. It's all about overhead. Right? It's, it's like running a business. You know, I, I want to just practice medicine. I want to go to the hospital, see my patients. You, okay, so Preet, you have the perfect, so talk to your dad. I guarantee your dad will tell you not to go into private practice. Guarantee it. I guarantee Talk to anybody in private practice, and they'll tell you to run away from it. I think I think it will eventually, Giannis, but not yet. I think eventually it will trickle down the hospitals. But if you're in medicine, working in hospitals is the safest place right now. Okay, medicine has taken a have taken a big hit. If you're in medicine for the money, you're in the wrong place. He did. He said it's going away. Yeah. Uh, even group practice. Group practice is going down down the tubes. Groups out. We're going to be civil, sir. Within 10 years, we'll be making, you know, in, in Canada, doctors really, they're like civil servants. They make like $50,000 a year. That's where the U.S. doctors are heading. So if you guys are coming to U.S. to make money, it's not why you come here. <laughs> Eddie, I like the way you think, Eddie. Um, okay, so here's how you make money. Go into fields where you have to take cash, like dermatology. Dermatology, because you do Botox all day. That's where you make money. Dermatology. Ophthalmology is still good. Radiology is still good. Plastics is good, but it's impossible to get into plastics now. Nobody can get into plastics anymore. General surgery, uh, they don't make any money. You know what's good on opto? If you do LASIK, I LASIK eye surgery. So pathology, yeah, pathology is good. OB guy gets killed with the malpractice insurance. OB guy and malpractice insurance, I heard, is up to two hundred thousand dollars a year. It kills you. Yeah, talk to obstetricians; they're getting killed. Uh, anesthesia still makes money for now, but who knows? Who knows what the future holds? All right, let's get back to the class. I don't want to scare you guys away. I want you guys to do well on the test, no matter what. 
We have to just focus on the exam. We'll talk about your future later. If you want future advice, we can we can talk about that another time. <laughs> Let's get you through the exam first. Okay, let's do this question. You, can, you guys can, let's get through the exam first, one step at a time. One step at a time. Okay, we're going to close the poll. We're going to close the poll. And now the answer is B. So now you can give a synchronized shock. Now you can give a synchronized shock. Okay, so let's go through the question. Um, this patient's in a step-down unit, uh, just had a, had, a, had a cabbage. And he's confused, he's agitated, his heart rate is 220, his blood pressure is low. Um, respirations are okay. He's lethargic. Uh, extremities are cool. And what do you see here? What do we see here? What is this? What is this? Ventricular tachycardia. So now you see wide complex tachycardia, right? Now you see wide com complex tachycardia, but it's organized, okay? So wide complex tachycardia, but it's nice and organized, okay? So very big contrast to ventricular fibrillation is this is very organized. Okay, so this is ventricular tachycardia. Now, I want to spend a minute on the blood pressure here. I want to define hypotension. Let's talk about hypotension for a second. Hypotension is a systolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure less than 90 or a MAP, mean arterial pressure less than 65, less than 65, a MAP less than 65, or a drop, you could have a drop in the systolic blood pressure of over 40. So a drop in the systolic blood pressure of over 40 is also considered hypotension. So three different things that we consider hypotension. Okay, SBP, uh, systolic blood pressure less than 90, MAP less than 65, or a drop in the systolic blood pressure of over 40. Okay. So this patient is hemodynamically unstable. So this patient is hemodynamically unstable. So when you're dealing with VTAC, you're dealing with VTAC, like in this question, the first thing you want to ask, when you look at VTAC, what's the very first question you want to ask? What's the very first thing you want to ask? Before you even get to stable or unstable, it's something else you have to look at. Very good, Sylvia. Very, very good, Sylvia. The pulse. You want to look at the pulse. Because if there's no pulse, we call that pulseless ventricular tachycardia. And how do we treat pulseless VTAC? We defibrillate. We defibrillate, okay? Which is remember, defibrillate means we deliver an unsynchronized shock. Defibrillate means we give an unsynchronized shock, okay? 
Because guess what? If you have no pulse, what are you synchronizing your shock with? Right? If you, if you don't feel the pulse, that means there's no, there's nothing to synchronize your shock to. Okay, so you cannot synchronize a shock to a patient with pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Okay, so if a pulseless VTAC, you treat it the same exact way as you treat VFib, which is defibrillate. Okay, which is defibrillate. Okay. Okay. Now, if you do have a pulse, If you do have a pulse, the next question is, is the patient stable? Okay. And if the patient is stable, let's go back to that in a second. Let's see if the patient's not stable. If the patient's not stable, now we give a synchronized shock or cardioversion. So synchronized shock, that is cardioversion. So now we do synchronized shock. The patient in the question, he had a pulse, but he was unstable. So that guy gets the synchronized shock shock okay now if the patient is stable and when i say stable i talk about a couple of things i talk about blood pressure right we spoke about blood pressure is he hypotensive but also mental status is the patient confused right the patient in the question was also confused that makes them unstable because confusion means if the patient has confusion that means they're not perfusing their brain okay and that's an important point if the patient has heart failure, congestive heart failure, that means the heart's failing because it's not pumping enough, or if the patient has chest pain, right? These things, all these things make the patient unstable. If the patient has any of these, the patient is not stable. Now, if your patient is stable, you can try adenosine. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. You could try adenosine. If adenosine fails, then you have a couple of options. You could try amio. You could try procainamide. Okay, you could try amio. You could try procainamide. You could try soda wall. Okay, you could try soda wall. If that fails, now you could try lidocaine. You could try lidocaine. Okay. And then if all this fails, you could just shock. Okay, so one, adenosine. Two, vagal maneuvers is for SVT, right? We're talking about VT. So vagal maneuvers do not play a role here. Okay. So the reason why we're trying adenosine, and I'll get back to this a little bit later, is this guy may actually have an SVT with what we call a barency. And that's why you're trying adenosine. I'll get back to this later, but I just want to point that out now. Adenosine does not treat VTAC. So if you're certain this is VTAC, you're not going to give adenosine. And I'll get back to this a little bit later. If you're absolutely certain this is VTAC, you're not going to give adenosine. But if there's any question, the guidelines say you could try adenosine. And I'll get back to this a little bit later. Okay, but adenosine does not treat VTAC. And that's an important point. I'll get back to this a little bit later. But the guidelines say... You can try this, okay? So, um, if that fails, you'd give amiodarone, procainamide, or sodalol. Uh, if that fails, you give lidocaine. If that fails, then you can shock. And I'll get back to what I mean by adenosine uh, a little bit later. But remember, adenosine does not treat VTAC. But if you're not certain, because there's certain situations where you can be confused, and I'll get back to that later, then you want to try adenosine. But if you're certain it's VTAC, or if the patient's unstable, you're certainly not going to give adenosine. Maria, uh, the notes say do not shock in. What do the notes say, Maria? Well, we're not talking about PA rest, though. So we're talking about VTAC, right? So for PA rest, we never shock, but we're talking about VTAC, right? We're not talking about PA rest. That's a different, that's a different, yeah, that's a different rhythm, right? So for PA rest, you don't shock because 
PAS is a non-shockable rhythm, but we're talking about VTAC, which is a completely different rhythm, right? Vito, why are you confused? I don't know what's on 318. I don't, have the, I don't have the book in front of me. Okay, so just look at the slide here. So, so this is the algorithm. This is how you deal with VTAC. So the first thing you do, so, you know, forget about the book for a second. Everything on the slide is how you deal with VTAC. So you know what VTAC looks like, right? I showed you VTAC on the other slide, right? So you see what VTAC looks like. You look for a pulse. If you see pulses VTAC, you defibrillate, right? Do you guys get that? Right, so if you see VTAC, and you feel no pulse, we call that pulseless VTAC, you defibrillate, right? So pulseless VTAC is VFib, defibrillate. That's it. So everything we spoke about for VFib is how you deal with pulseless VTAC. Pulseless, sorry. Pulseless VTAC is VFib. So you just defibrillate. Now, if you have a pulse, right, if you have a pulse and you're stable, right, if you have a pulse and you're stable, you give medication. Right? So you have three different scenarios. One, Pulses VTAC equals VFib. Bam, defibrillate. Then you have a pulse and you're stable. You medicate. Then you have a pulse, but you're unstable. <coughs> <coughs> and that's when you give the sacred arts. Okay, sacred heart shock. So those are three different scenarios. So pulse and unstable is sacred heart shock. Okay. So let's go back to the question. <clears throat> and summarize. So this is VTAC. If I gave you the same question, and I told you that the patient had no pulse, the answer is defibrillate, okay? So if I gave you the same question, I said there was no pulse, the answer is defibrillate. If I gave you the same rhythm, and I said the blood pressure was 120 over 80, out of the options on the page, what's the answer? Yes, Rika, right. The answer would be A, medication. Okay, so if I change the question around and gave you the same rhythm, and this can happen, this can happen. You can you can see that, and I see this. You can see this rhythm on the telemetry monitor. You walk in the room, and the patient sitting there reading a newspaper, hanging out, drinking a cup of coffee. Nothing's wrong with the patient. Excuse me. Okay, Medicaid. Okay, and that's how you deal with that patient. So that's a patient that has stable VTAC. Okay, I could do that. I could do that. Why not? Okay, no, that's a good idea. So that's what that's what we do. Okay, so that's how you do. That's how it works. Okay. 
Ventricular tachycardia is a wide complex tachycardia. At this time, you have an organized pattern. There's no P waves. Um, uh, pulse is conducted slowly. The pulse conduction is slowed around areas of infarction, injury, or, or ischemia. And that's why this occurs. Um, there's an ectopic or irritable foci that goes around the AV node or, or, or re-entry through the AV node. Now, this is an impulse that's conducted from myocyte to myocyte without the bundle of his or McKinsey fibers. Uh, this gives you a slow conduction, and that's why you see a wide complex. So if you take a look at the heart, I'll spend a look at the a minute talking about the conduction of the heart. So conduction starts, normal conduction starts in the SA node, okay? And the SA node fires action potentials at about 80 to 100 beats per minute, right? 80 to 100 beats per minute, okay? Um, this is the pacemaker of the heart. The impulse goes through the atria, and it goes through the AV node, okay? And remember, AV nodal conduction is very slow. So on the EKG, what on the EKG tells me my AV nodal conduction? What on the EKG tells me AV nodal conduction? Right, PR interval. All right, PR interval tells me my AV nodal conduction. And what is the normal PR interval? What is the normal PR interval? Right, 200. 200 milliseconds. Right, 200 milliseconds. That's a normal PR interval. Now, why do you want to have slow conduction through the AV node? Why do you need that slow conduction through the AV node? Very good, Sylvia. To give you time for diastolic filling. So the AV, the so the PR interval is still part of diastole, right? So it gives you time for AV nodal filling. So <clears throat> get this. If this is your PR interval, right? Here's your, QR, here's your QRS. This is when systole starts. So the PR interval is still part of diastole. Okay. So this is why, right? If a patient has a myocardial infarction, right? You just had a myocardial infarction. What drug must that patient get to improve their mortality? What improves mortality in a patient that's just had an MI? Beta blockers. Okay. Why are beta blockers so important in patients that just had ischemic damage to their heart? Right, because the beta blockers slow down AV nodal conduction. They prolong the PR interval. When you prolong the PR interval, you spend more time in diastole. And diastole is when you perfuse your myocardium. So not only do you, when you slow the heart rate, not only do you reduce oxygen demands, remember supply and demand, remember economics, supply and demand, I hate economics, supply and demand, well, same thing with the heart. Not only does do beta blockers reduce demand, but they increase the supply because they prolong the PR interval, they make you spend more time in diastole, and diastole is when you perfuse the myocardium. So that's why beta blockers are so vital, okay? Calcium channel blockers have not been shown to improve mortality, okay? So we do not use calcium channel blockers in these patients. Beta blockers do. Now, if you have a patient with AFib, calcium channel blockers will slow AV nodal conduction, okay? They will. They will slow AV nodal conduction, and that's because they inhibit calcium from entering the AV nodal cells. So they will also prolong the pure interval, okay? My pleasure. This is fun for me. This is my fun time. I'm a geek, I know. So this is why beta blockers improve mortality. Okay, this is how they work. This is why they're they're so important. You can tell. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. That's very sweet. <laughs> That's nice. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure, guys. Thank you, Giannis. I'm glad I'm helping. Good. Very good. Okay, so so that's why beta blockers are so important. It gives you more time for diastolic filling, and you want time for diastolic filling. Okay, you want time for diastolic filling. Okay, so after your action potential leaves the AV node, it goes down through, what do you call this? 
with this here. Bundle of fists, good, bundle of fists. And then you go to right and left bundle. And then you go to the Pekinji fibers. What's special about the bundle of fists and Pekinji fibers? I'm back. Don't get scared. I'm sorry. I'm back. Every once in a while, I just get kicked off. Is the audio back? Okay. Yeah, this happened last night, too. I just get kicked off sometimes. Okay. <laughs> you want to play peekaboo? <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Okay, so what you guys are saying, what's special about the, 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 the bundle of fists and the Rikinji fibers is fast conduction, rapid conduction, right? So if the Avino conducts slowly, which they do, the Rikinji fibers and the bundle of fists conducts fast, 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 okay? Conducts fast. And remember, when you're looking at, when you're looking at the, QRS, let's compare this to your ventricular action potential. Here's your ventricular action potential. Here's your ventricular action potential. We've looked at this before a little bit. Here's phase four, here's phase zero, here's phase one, here's phase two, here's phase three, and here's phase four again. Okay. And remember, phase zero is sodium channels opening, right? Opens fast, closes fast. So sodium rushes inside the cell, rapid upstroke, and that's what gives you the QRS. Okay. Now, these cells, they're conducting, this action potential is conducting very fast, fast. And that is what gives you the narrow complex. Okay. So because these, these cells are conducting fast, you get a narrow complex on the EKG. So what's the normal QRS complex? What's the normal QRS complex? Hundred and twenty milliseconds. Good, good, good. Hundred and twenty milliseconds. All right, so that's the normal. That's a normal QRS complex. One hundred and twenty milliseconds, right? One hundred and twenty milliseconds is a normal QRS complex. That happens because rapid conduction, rapid conduction of the bundle of fists and the Purkinje fibers. Okay, that's why you see this. So if you were to take away the bundle of fists and Purkinje fibers, you would see slower conduction through the ventricle. Now remember, these myocytes have gap junctions. Remember? The myocytes have gap junctions. So if you were to look at these myocytes, right, the myocytes have gap junctions, and they can conduct through the gap junctions. But that conduction is slow, right? That's slow conduction. So in ventricular tachycardia, you have an irritable foci somewhere in the ventricle. Start somewhere in the ventricle. Let's say over here. Here's an irritable foci that just starts firing action potentials. And now it starts over here, and it conducts. And it conducts. It can't conduct, but it conducts outside of the rapid conducting uh, a bundle of hiss and Purkinje fibers. It conducts, and it conducts from myocyte to myocyte through the gap junctions, and it conducts slowly. And that gives you a wide QRS. And that's why the QRS is wide. That's why you see a wide QRS. Okay, so wh why do you have an irritable foci? What's the cause of this? Who knows? Could be hypoxemia, could be structural damages, could be electrolyte abnormalities, There's several different things. Could be medications, right? A lot of the antiarrhythmics. A lot of your antiarrhythmics are proarrhythmics, right? A lot of the antiarrhythmics are, are proarrhythmics because they mess with this, right? So what antiarrhythmics mess with phase zero? Yeah, class one, right? So if I were to tell you, that your action potential
did this, what drug is that? Class 1A, which is what? Procainamide and quinidine. Good, procainamide and quinidine. Okay, so that's class 1. Okay, so on EKG, what would you see? QRS. What's happened to the QRS? Wide. And what about QT interval? What about QT interval? Would the QT interval be? Yeah. So guess what? Guess what? Can you use procainamide in a patient with a QT prolongation? Can you? No way, Jose. What channels are you inhibiting here? What channels affect are affected in phase three? Right, you're what we call delayed rectifying potassium channel. Delayed rectifying potassium channels. Okay. The so-called delayed rectifying potassium channels. Okay. So class 1A, they inhibit sodium channels over here in phase zero, but they also inhibit the delayed rectifying potassium channels, and that can cause QT prolongation. So you cannot use them. Okay. Now what if I told you that your drug did this. What class is that? One C. One C. Good. And what would that do to the QRS in the Yeah, that widens it because that slows. That will widen the QRS interval because that will slow the sodium channels. When you slow the sodium channels, when you slow the sodium channels in phase zero, when you block those sodium channels in phase zero, guess what? You widen that QRS. What does that do to the QT interval? What do you think? Does it? Yeah, it's the same. No change. No change. So what are your what are your class one C? What are your class one C? What are the big ones? There's a bunch. But what are the important ones? Doesn't affect the QT interval here. Lidocaine lidocaine is is one B. Lidocaine is one B. Uh, it's it's flecainide and propafenol. One C is flecainide. Good. One C is flecainide. Good. And propafenol. And propafenol. That's one C. Okay. These drugs do not affect the QT interval because it doesn't affect phase zero. Uh, three. Sorry. Sorry. Only phase three affects the QT interval. So class class one C. The big ones you should know: flecainide and propafenol. They do not uh, affect the QT interval because they do not affect. Uh, uh, phase uh, three. Okay, and one C, just to be thorough, one B. Sorry, one B includes lidocaine, lidocaine, and so one B will actually do this. It actually will shorten the action potential. That's one B, and that's lidocaine, and and uh, and mixolydian. Okay, so that's one B. That's lidocaine and mixolydian. Those are the big ones. And phenytoin, phenytoin is one B. So that's that's one B, just to be thorough. Okay. All right. What class will do this? This is class three. This is class three. And will this affect the QT interval? Yeah. So this is a dangerous class. When you 
prolong, right, when you prolong phase three, when you prolong phase three, you prolong the QT interval, right? So here's your QT interval. So you, you, you are prolonging the QT interval. Here's your T wave, right? So when you prolong, when you inhibit class, when you inhibit phase three, when you inhibit phase three, you cause QT prolongation. This is class three. So class three inhibits phase three. What are the channels here? What channels are you affecting here? Potassium channels. Delayed rectifying potassium channels. Delayed re rectifying means repolarizing, right? Rectifying means repolarizing. Delayed rectifying, delayed means slow. Delayed rectifying uh, potassium channels, they give you repolarization. Okay, and that's an important class. What class, what drugs are in this class? All right, so, um, man, do you have my note box? I want to type these out. I can't find my note box. Yeah, the mnemonic is, to remember this, is AIDS, right? The mnemonic is, oops, that's not what I wanted. AIDS, right? Now, amiodarone, what class is amiodarone? All class, good. What is I? I've utilized, right? I've utilized. Um, what's the D? So, fetalize. And what's the S? Sort of. So guess what? Will these affect the QT interval? These will, right? QT prolongation. Now, because because amio has properties of all four classes, it doesn't have much effect on a QT interval, so it's actually safe. Okay. One more antiarrhythmic is drone have you guys heard of drone odoro anybody here of drone odoro sylvia what class is drone odoro it's all four classes it's all four just like Amy. So we like amiodarone. Amiodarone's properties of all four classes. And and cardiac wise, now amiodarone cardiac wise is actually the safest antiarrhythmic, right? By the way, just to be thorough, what's class two antiarrhythmics? What are your class two antiarrhythmics? Yeah, those are your beta blockers. Good. And what about class four? Good, constant channel block. Good. Okay. So amiodarone is, has all properties of all four classes, right? And it's actually cardiac-wise the safest drug. But I'm sure everybody knows extra cardiac-wise it's a disaster, right? Why? What are your side effects of amiodarone? Everybody has to know this, right? Hyper or hypothyroidism, which one? Both, good. Hyper, hypothyroidism. Pulmonary fibrosis, hepatotoxicity, toxicity, blue skin, uh, eye problems, everything. So, um, some drug company about six or seven years ago said, "Hey, amiodarone because it is <laughs> amiodarone because it is lipophilic causes all of these problems. So maybe we should make a drug that is just like amiodarone, but is not lipophilic, and that's where." drone odorone came from. So they made this drug and they put it in clinical trials. And guess what happened? Guess which class of patients had an increase in mortality? So it's contraindicated in these patients. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. You got it. CHF. So this is important to know. Do not give drone odorone to patients with heart failure. So if you see a question, we'll talk about heart failure when we get back. Heart failure, no drone odorone. Okay. All right. So we went off on a very big tangent, but I, 
I, you know, I, I don't think you guys get enough uh, of the antiarrhythmics. And that's, that's, you know, very good idea. So you need to know when you, you should use them and not use them. When they contraindicate them. And, and you should know when the QT interval is an important one. Okay. Okay, good. All right, you guys want to take a 10-minute break? All right, see you in 10 minutes. back in 10 minutes.
Okay. Let's go back to the slide set. Okay. So we're talking about electrical conduction through the heart. Okay, so remember, if you see a white complex, QRS, that means there's some issue with this conduction system. Now, it could be ventricular tachycardia, which we just went over, right? It could be con con uh, ventricular tachycardia, or there's other things that can give you white complex, and that could be interference with this pathway. For example, a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block, they can give you wide QRS complex because they will slow ventricular conduction. So again, anything that slows ventricular conduction can give you a widened QRS complex. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But I'm just bringing it up now. A left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block, they can give you widened QRS on the EKG. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay. Okay. So sustained VTAC is greater than 30 seconds with symptoms. We went over if it's um, unstable, immediate synchronized cardioversion. If it's stable, again, you could try adenosine first. But again, adenosine doesn't treat VTAC. This is if you're uncertain. But if you're certain it's VTAC, you can get procainamide, sotalol, or amiodarone. Now remember, if you have QT prolongation, and remember, you're not going to see QT into the one VTAC, right? That's that's important. But if you if you happen to have seen uh, an EKG before the patient was in VTAC, and they could tell you this in the question. They could say that the patient previously had QT prolongation, right? Either way, if the question says QT prolongation, this drug is out because it's 1A, this drug is out because it's class 3. The only drug you can give for a patient with prolonged QT interval is amiodarone, bottom line. Okay, I just want to bring that point up. Uh, Lighter claim is class 1B, okay? And then you could shock the patient if that fails. Okay, let's take a poll on this question. Okay, so let's close the poll. And the answer is C, magnesium. Who asked me about magnesium before? When do you ask me about magnesium? All right, you happy now? What do you see on this rhythm strip? Told you. What do you see? Make sure you can recognize this. This is a polymorphic VTAC. Okay. Polymorphic is different than monomorphic because it's it's disorganized. This is torsades. This is torsades. Okay, so be able to recognize torsades. Treatment for torsades is always magnesium. Now, if this patient is unsuitable to deliver, right? Very good. Unsynchronized shock. Good. So I'm going to make a very important statement now. I'm going to make a very important statement now. Unsynchronized shock is used in three situations and three situations only. 
And every other shock we talk about is synchronized. So the three situations for unsynchronized shock are the fib, pulseless. What does pulses mean? Can't feel pulse. The tack and torso. That's it. That's it. That's it. Every other shock, every other shock is synchronized. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. V fib, pulses, V tac, torso. That is it. So only three situations where you're going to give an unsynchronized shock. Bottom line. Okay. Now, what precedes torso to the EKG? QT prolongation. Now, let's spend a few minutes. We, we spoke a little bit about QT prolongation. Let's spend a few more minutes on it. So, we spoke about the antirhythmics. What about electrolyte abnormalities? What electrolyte abnormalities can cause, right, diuretics because diuretics cause what? Leads to, right, hypokalemia. Good. What else? Hypomagnesia. Good. And then hypocalcemia. Right, all of them. Okay. Now remember that hypomag can lead to low PTH, right? Magnesium is essential for PTH secretion, and that can lead to low calcium. That's important to know, right? Okay. And all of these can slow down your delayed rectifying potassium channel, and that can cause QT prolongation. Now, in addition to antiarrhythmics, and I, you know, I, I really think. That's why you always give magnesium. I really think that you're going to see more of these questions on step two. I really think this is going to become high yield because you cannot read a medical journal without them bringing this up nowadays. What other drugs can cause QT prolongation outside of the antiarrhythmics? Non-cardiac drugs. What else? TCAs can. So macrolides. This is important because about three years ago, there was a very large article looking at azithromycin, right? And, and doctors are giving out azithromycin like water, right? So this is important. Now, this is, this is not seen in, in, in young studs like myself. This is seen in elderly patients with cardiac issues, okay? Right, Amber, who's, MR, MR, everybody's giving out z -Pak. Right? Every, everybody's getting a Z-Pack. So this is important. Uh, fluoroquinolones. Excellent. Somebody said fluoroquinolones. That's important. And somebody said methadone. That's important. And antipsychotics. That is huge. Okay. Now here's all the data. You have a little old demented lady. This is what I deal with every day. Okay. There's a little old demented lady. And she's kicking you in the face. She's running around the room. And what do you do? Well, you want to sedate her, right? And then you give her you give her some antipsychotics, and all of them do this: the old ones, the atypicals, respiral, uh, um, lanzapine, and all of a sudden she dies. What happened? QT prolongation. So all of these drugs inhibit the delayed rectifying potassium channels, and they prolong the QT interval. So all of the antipsychotics, all of them, the atypicals. And, and, and even the atypicals and the old ones. So be very careful. And I think you will be tested on this, okay? Because, you know, the ADA wants you to know this. Uh, the AMA wants you to know this. I'm sorry, the AMA wants you to know this. The test takers will want you to know this because these drugs kill people. In fact, um, what, the, what, what is happening now is the U.S. government is stepping in. And if you, they're actually going around to nursing homes. And if you're a doctor that works in a nursing home, which I think is the worst job in the world, by the way, and you have patients in antipsychotics, they will cite you for this reason. I'd rather, I'd rather dig graves than work in a nursing home. I can't think of a worse job than working in a nursing home. Right, Athea? <laughs> Why? Because your patients all look like this. Have you been to a nursing home? Might as well work in the morgue. 
thoughts. There's nothing more depressing. It's a reminder every day, go to work. Kavita, you, you rotated once? Kavita, did... Okay, could somebody ask you a question, Kavita? When you were walking through the hallways, was, was this what you were thinking? This is my future. <laughs> Someday this will be me. Or this will be my parents. Or my... Isn't it horrible? It's so horrible. I hate nursing homes. Like punishment. Yeah, it's really it's sad. It's sad. I don't want to get old. My, my mom told me that when she hits 65, she wants me to just... <laughs> but she's getting close though. So she, as she gets old, she pushes it. She used to say sixty-five. Now she puts it to seventy. Yeah, it's sad. So, um, anyway, the government is stepping in and they're going to nursing homes. And if patients are on antipsychotics, you're in trouble because QT prolongation. So this is why you will be tested on it. It's because it's, you know, it's important to know that these drugs kill. They kill. They kill. They kill. So, step two, a question you want: What improves mortality in both ways? What drugs improve mortality? What drugs will kill you? Okay. Speaking of what drugs improve mortality, let's take a step back to VTAC for a second. Okay. Give me a patient who commonly comes in with VTAC. What type of patients come in with VTAC, right? We spoke about drugs and stuff, but what kind of patient will just be walking down the street and bam, going to VTAC? Is that MI, of course, right? MI. How about systolic heart failure? Right? What if you have an ejection fraction? What if the exam tells you? What if the exam tells you here's a guy with an ejection fraction of 30%? What do you do for this patient? What do you do for this patient? And every patient gets this that prevents them from having VTAC. Well, okay, let's take a step back. You're right, let me rephrase that. So guys, so Lex. Let's talk about this patient. So guy's an ejection fraction of 30%. He had a heart attack, let's just say. That patient gets carbidolol or metoprolol. One of those. And it should be long-acting metoprolol. Good. What else did that patient get? Right, so we spoke about the benefits of beta blockers, how they slow down the heart rate, and that increases time in diastole, right? That's good. What else? Levetolol, no, Amar, because these are the two. So the reason why I'm saying these two, I spelled it wrong, sorry. The reach because of studies, right? There are studies that show that these are the beta blockers that improve mortality. That's why. They should also get an ACE inhibitor. Or ARB. Good. What else do they get? Uh, Fabio, digoxin is the last drug they get. Why is digoxin the la very last drug they get? I'm going to put it on the bottom of the list. And I'm going to put Lasix on the bottom of the list. Bingo. Here's my question to you. What drugs improve mortality? And that's what they're going to ask you. What drugs improve mortality? Carbidolol, metoprolol succinate. ACE inhibitors, ARBs. Digoxin, no way. Lasix, you're going to give, and here's a question I'll give you. They'll give you a guy with an ejection fraction of 30%, and on physical exam, there's no JVD. There's no crackles on his lungs. There's no ascites. There's no pitting edema. The patient is not volume overloaded. And they'll say, which one of the drugs is the right answer? And guess which is the wrong answer? Ferrosamide is the wrong answer. Pre calcium channel blockers do not improve mortality in these patients. Okay, you don't need to give this patient diuretic because they're not volume overloaded. Aspirin, if they have coronary artery disease, absolutely. So if you have CAD, aspirin's a must, of course. So spironolactone, bam, yes, of course. Okay, and then they get breast. And then what do you give them? You give them breast. If it's a woman, it's okay, but if guys don't like breast, you give them breast, what do you do now? You switch them to what? Claritone, right. Good. 
guy comes in, says, turn me into a woman, what kind of a doctor are you? Switch into a player and all. They get gynecomastia. Spironolactin gives you gynecomastia. Side effect of spironolactone is gynecomastia. <laughs> guy comes in and says, you turned me into a woman. What's wrong with you? They run spironolactone. Okay, so you switch into a player and all. Okay. Now, your patient is on all of these drugs. Okay. You have improved their mortality immensely, immensely, immensely. Um, there's no evidence for that now, for time slowing down. Now, what if I told you that the patient was African American? Can I do more to improve his mortality? This is, this is a good question. This is a tough question. Calcium channel blockers? No, no, no. Thiazides? No. This is a tough question. To get this, you get a bonus. Send you a box of cookies. Statins are for CAD. I'm talking about ACE. I'm talking about heart failure. So yes, statins are for mortality. Yes, of course. If you have coronary artery disease, I'm talking about low ejection fraction. This is if either if you if they're African American or what if you have a contraindication? What if the patient is on an ACE inhibitor? And it's a type four. This is a good question. Type 4 RTA on an ACE inhibitor. Right? What do you switch that patient to that will also improve the mortality? By the way, my, my third year resident didn't know this question today. So if you don't know this question, it's okay. But this is a good question. Direct random blockers have not been shown to improve mortality. The answer is you could give the patient a combination of hydrolazine and long acting nitroglycerin. This comes from a study about, I was a resident, so it was almost 10 years ago when this study came out. And this study looked at African Americans with low ejection fraction. And these patients got hydrolyzine with nitroglycerin. And the patients that got this combination had a very large reduction in mortality. So the outcome of this study was huge. Yeah, the hydrolyzine dilates the arteries, and the nitroglycerin dilates the veins. So, in the, so notice this: the mortality benefit in heart failure is all, all about afterload reduction. And afterload is a bad thing for a failing heart, right? If you have a bad heart, you want to get that afterload down, down, down. You see, when you have a low cardiac output, when that low cardiac output gets to the kidneys, what happens? You know, for some reason, the study, yeah, that study was done in African Americans, and he never did it in Caucasians for some reason. So that's what you commonly see. Yeah, low cardiac output will give you high renin levels. And angiotensin 2, what will angiotensin 2 do? Vasoconstricts the arterial. And when you vasoconstrict the arterials, what does that do to your afterload? Jacks it up. TPR goes up, afterload goes up. So now what you're dealing with is a failing heart, a weak heart. That has to work hard to pump out blood. You guys ever go to the gym and you have a hangover? Anybody ever go out heavy night of drinking? And you go to the gym the next day? Try to how much, right? That's what your heart's doing. That's what's happening here. So you're making a failing heart. You're making a weak heart work hard. So afterload is a bad thing. You reduce the afterload, you improve mortality. So notice everything that improves mortality reduces the afterload. Do beta blockers reduce the afterload? Yeah, how? Rika, how do they improve afterload? Right, they inhibit renin release. So if you increase sympathetic drive to the juxtamalar apparatus, there's beta-1 receptors, and that increases renin release. So beta blockers inhibit renin release. So good, very good. You guys are good. You guys are good. They actually block renin release, so that's important. So blocking the RAS system, Improves mortality and heart failure. Okay. This is all systolic heart failure. We don't have the data for diastolic. Okay. This is all systolic. That's why I put the ejection fractions 30%. So now your patient's on all these medications. Okay. And then they come back to see you and they're taking the medications. They're doing well, right? They're not having symptoms. They're on all these medications. Okay. Uh, but you have to make sure they're on these medications first. So what do I mean? A beta blocker, an ACE or an ARB, and spironolactone. Okay, they have to be on all these medications. 
And if they're African American, you should add the hydralazine and nitroglycerin on top of this. Okay, so so now they're on all these medications and they come back to see you. An ejection fraction, because these medications can actually improve the ejection fraction, right? But they come back to see you, and the ejection fraction is still 30%. What's the next step? What do you do now? Not ditch, not yet. See, see, I'm going to tell you, ditch is almost always the wrong answer. Any moody you're close. The answer is AICD, implantable cardioverted defibrillator. You give them an implantable defibrillator. Why do you give them a defibrillator? Does that improve mortality? You betcha. Why does it improve mortality? Because patients with structural damage go into ventricular tachycardia. Right? When you have a dilated, a big, fat, floppy, dilated left ventricle, big, fat, floppy, like my head, dilated left ventricle, and you go into VTAC. And if you go into VTAC, it shocks you out. Now, Eddie brought up a bi V pacemaker. You know what a bi V pacemaker is? Bi ventricular pacemaker. Bi ventricular pacemaker. What it does is what we call. It's, it does what we call cardiac resynchronization. Now, Eddie, you brought it up, right? So when is that the right answer? Because it was the wrong answer for this patient. When is that the right answer? Ejection fraction has to be low. And by the way, less than 35% is the cutoff. With what? It has to be something else. Not edema. The, the answer is on the EKG. The QRS has to be wide. And wide means greater than 120 milliseconds, right? Why? What does a wide QRS tell me? What's going on? My conduction's all screwed up. So, what a BIV pacemaker does is it gives you cardiac resynchronization. It gets the right and left ventricles to contract together, together, and that improves mortality. So if you have, if you have an ejection fraction of less than thirty-five percent, ejection fraction is less than. Let me fix this. Less than thirty-five percent, and and the QRS is normal, which is less than. 120 milliseconds, the answer is just an ICD, a defibrillator. Okay? If the ejection fraction is less than 35% and you have QRS widening, the answer is they get a bi V pacemaker. And that's the difference. I want to bring up one important point is we do not put these invasive devices in people unless they get all the medications I spoke about first. Okay, that I want to make sure that's clear. So if a guy comes in and he's not on a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor, the, 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 these devices are the wrong answer. This is a patient who's been taking these medications for at least several months. And the exam will tell you three or four months. Okay, they'll tell you. Patient's been on, you know, lisinopril and, and corvetolol and spirolactone for six months or, or three months. Don't worry too much about the timing. They're not going to give you exact cutoff. But if the patient comes in and they're not on any medications, medical management first. The Johnson is the right answer when your patient is on everything on the slide and they're still having symptoms. And they're going to the hospital. Well, again, you know, the cut they're not the cutoff could be at least three to six months. So they're not going to ask you exact cutoff. The point is they'll tell you the patient comes in for a follow-up and they've been on these medications. You have to give them at least at least three to six months of medical management. At least three to six months of medical management before you consider doing an implantable defibrillator. Okay, at least I'm gonna say three months is probably good enough. At least three months of of, um, of medication. So 
this is the answer if they're still having symptoms after being on. So it's the last drug for heart failure. It's almost never the right answer anymore. Okay. All right. So that's that's heart failure. Okay. These are these mortality drugs that improve mortality is what they will ask you. So so you guys brought up aspirin and statins. That's true. Okay. But that's true for patients with coronary artery disease, which by the way, most patients with systolic heart failure have. So yes, you're right. But I was really going after the low ejection fraction question. Yeah, we actually have ditch toxicity in tomorrow's night's lecture, John. So tomorrow I'm going to talk a lot about the exact um, relationship between ditch and potassium because it's an important relationship that we're going to talk about tomorrow. It's in the toxicology section. Okay, so this is high yield stuff. This is what they will ask you. So, so these, this is stuff that they will ask you on the exam because why mortality? benefit and we have we have a lot of studies that show that this stuff improves mortality so plantable defibrillators for when they go into VTAC okay any questions on this stuff remember ACE inhibitors and ARBs reduce the afterload reducing the afterload improves mortality hydralazine reduces the afterload beta blockers reduces the afterload it's all about after load reduction, okay. Furosemide and digoxin do not improve mortality. They do not improve mortality. So they're not they're, they're not what you need. Uh, because if you have a wide uh, QRS complex, that means you're right in the ventricle and not contracting together. So so when you when you do the binary pacemaker, it puts them it makes them contract at the same time. And studies show that there's a mortality benefit. Okay, so that's why we do that. There's a, there's a mortality benefit. Okay. Okay, so that's it. That's important stuff. Okay, we move along. It's time for narrow complex tachycardia. Ready for narrow complex? We're done with wide complex. Okay. Narrow complex means the QRS complex is less than 120 milliseconds. You see that as the P waves, the topic foci. Now, in these patients, you have, the, 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 you have supraventricular, meaning that the, the impulse comes from above the ventricle. The impulse comes from above the ventricle. So this is not ventricular tachycardia. The impulse either comes from the AV node itself, the AV node itself, or the atrium. Okay? But when that impulse makes it into the ventricle, when it gets past the AV node, it goes down the normal ventricular conduction, right, which is the bundle of his and Purkinje fibers, and that's why you see a narrow complex. Let's take a poll on this question. Okay, let's close the poll. <laughs> uh, the answer is uh, B, adenosine. This is an important question. The answer is B, adenosine. So, um, palpitations, lightheadedness, uh, several symptoms. He had these symptoms in the past. Now, um, blood pressure is normal. Heart rate is very high. What do you see in the rhythm trip? What do you see here? Good. So when you're reading the EKG, first thing I want you to do is, is see, look at your, look at the, look at the rate, right? So if you look at the rate, is the rate fast or slow? 
or you see it's fast. So it's tachycardic. Narrow complex. Now, is it regular or irregular? Regular. So what's the diagnosis? SVT. Good. This is SVT. So the vitals are stable, right? The blood pressure is stable. Not all of them. The blood pressure is stable. So the blood pressure is stable. There's no reason to shock this patient, right? This is the answer if your blood pressure is low. So this is the answer when you have low blood pressure. So this patient's stable. So we're not going to shock this patient, okay? So first thing you would do is vagal maneuvers, like carotid sinus massage, right? Which was done and it failed. So the next thing you would do is, is adenosine. Next thing you would do is adenosine. So, so in the emergency setting, like this one, you see how fast the heart rate is? Oral drugs is all, always the wrong answer in the emergency room. So this guy has a very rapid heart rate. There's no time to wait for your stomach to absorb these drugs. If you give oral metoclopril, it takes at least half an hour to an hour for it to work. So oral drugs are always the wrong answer. Adenosine works like that. Adenosine works like that. Now, adenosine works very rapidly. Adenosine slows AV nodal conduction. Adenosine slows AV nodal conduction. By doing what? What is the action of adenosine in the AV node? What channels does it inhibit? Well, it does two channels, actually. It, it actually opens. What does it do to your potassium channels, Rika? What does adenosine do to your potassium channels? Right, it increases your potassium conductance. So if this is the cell, it increases potassium conductance, right? And that's what that does is that increases the efflux of potassium. Potassium has a positive charge, so that hyperpolarizes the cell. And that pushes it further away from threshold. So now you're going to fire less action potential. It also inhibits your calcium. So it inhibits your L-type calcium channel. So so remember, when calcium channels open, calcium influxes, right? And remember, in your AV node, it is the calcium influx that gives you the action potential, not sodium, right? In the AV node, we're talking about the AV node here. In the AV node, it's the calcium influx. It's the calcium influx. Right, now the action potential in the AV node is different, right? In the AV node, in the AV node, as well as the SA node, it looks different. It looks like this, right? Because you have phase four is an unstable resting phase, and then you have your threshold, here's your threshold, and then phase zero. So here, in the AV node, phase zero is a rapid upstroke. Calcium, right, your L-type calcium channels are responsible for this, right? So adenosine inhibits these L-type calcium channels, okay? And then phase three, as always, repolarization is always due to sodium channels, uh, potassium, excuse me. Phase three is always due to potassium channel. And phase four is a funny current, right? Phase four is a funny current, right? Which is slow sodium channels, right? All right. So what activates the funny current? Or what increases the funny current? What will increase the funny current? Acetylcholine will do the opposite, right? Acetylcholine will inhibit the funny current. Remember, if you increase the funny current, if you increase funny current, then you reach threshold faster, right? If you increase the funny current, you open more sodium channels, right? If you increase the funny current, you open more sodium channels, and you reach threshold faster. So the answer is sympathetics, epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? They will increase the funny current. Right? And this is why beta blockers, the 
because beta blockers block the beta-1 receptors, right? Epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to beta-1 receptors. Beta blockers will inhibit the beta-1 receptors. They'll slow down the funny current, and that will decrease the heart rate. Right? If you decrease the funny current, you'll hit threshold less frequently and your fire less action potentials. Right? Your calcium channel blockers work here. They inhibit these L-type calcium channels, right? And that will decrease the upslope. And that will inhibit AV node conduction. So your calcium channel blockers, they really work in the AV node. They slow down AV nodal conduction. Adenosine also works here. Okay, so adenosine will inhibit calcium channels and adenosine will also increase potassium conductance so now when that when you increase potassium conductance you're going to come all the way down here further away from threshold you see that you're going to be all the way down here thresholds up here when you open your potassium channels you're further away from threshold and that's what adenosine does opens potassium channels and, and inhibits calcium channels that's what adenosine does and that stops avenal conduction cold and that terminates svt You see, vagal maneuvers, vagal maneuvers will increase secretion of, of, of acetylcholine, which will do the same thing as adenosine, okay? Um, it doesn't make a difference. Vagal maneuvers don't do much, actually. They only work 30% of the time, so most people get adenosine. Okay, so SVT is a re-entry tachycardia within the AV node. Uh, heart rate can go very high up to 250. We do vagal maneuvers, then we try adenosine. If adenosine fails, then we could try the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or the joxin. So let me talk about SVT, how it works. SVT gives you what we call an AV nodal reentry tachycardia. AV nodal reentry tachycardia. Here's your atrial impulse that comes from the SA node, goes through the atria. Here's your AV node. This is the AV node. Now, these patients have two pathways a fast pathway and a slow pathway. Normally, your action potential goes down the AV node through the fast pathway, as well as the slow pathway. But because it's slow, by the time it gets to the end of the slow pathway, the bottom portion of the AV node is still in the refractory period. So this, this action potential terminates. And this action potential is conducted to the ventricle, and you have normal ventricular conduction. No problem. When you have an ectopic foci, Irritable foci that fires too early. When you have an irritable foci that fires too early, the fast pathway is still in the refractory period, so it gets terminated. But the slow pathway, because it's slow, takes its time, and by the time it gets down to the bottom of the AV node, it's no longer in the refractory period, and then it can go upwards in a retrograde fashion. And then you get what's called a re-entry tachycardia within the AV node, and it keeps circling within the AV node. And now you have two impulses. One goes through the atria, and you can see inverted P waves, and the other one goes through the ventricle. Now, because they're happening at the same time, you, sometimes it's hard to see the inverted P wave, right? Because they're happening simultaneously, the inverted P wave gets buried in the QRS complex. So it's very hard to see the inverted P wave. Sometimes you can see it if you look really hard, but it's usually buried. So what you wind up seeing is just the Q wave. And you can see up to a rate of 250. No, no delta wave. That's WPW. You're not going to see a delta wave here. That's completely different. We'll get to that later. No delta wave. You're not going to see a delta wave here. Okay? So that's what you're going to see. This is AV nodal reentry tachycardia. Okay? They come in with heart rates of up to 250. You give adenosine. And then what you do is you ablate the slow pathway. You do an ablation of the slow pathway, and they never have it again. They're cured. Okay? And that's SVT. Okay? And again, I'll show you. We'll go back to EKG. I have another one coming up later, but this is what it looks like. Okay? So it's, it's narrow complex, it's fast, and it's regular. Okay, and that's SVT. Okay, let's do this question. Take a poll on this question.
Okay, let's close the poll. And the answer is D. Ivy built higher than. The answer is D. Ivy built higher than. Okay. <laughs> Safi got, got it right. You know what? Let me do. There's a part two. Let me do part two, and then I'll summarize. Let's do part two. Let's do this part. Let's take a poll on this, and then we'll we'll summarize. Okay, let's close the poll. And the answer here is D, Kuminen. The answer is D. You should start the patient on Kuminen. Okay, let's go back to the question. What does this patient have? What do you see in the rhythm script here? Comes in with palpitations, dizziness. What do you see? Very good, AFib. So uh, you see <clears throat> narrow complex, narrow complex. Tachycardia, <clears throat> is it regular or ir irregular? It's irregularly irregular, irregularly irregular. Uh, and you don't see the sternum with P waves, right? So this is AFib. So, so atrial fibrillation, the atria is just fibrillating. Atria is just fibrillating. So when you have AFib, where does AFib come from? What is, what is the, what is the um, origin of AFib? No, the, the say note is gone. The say note is, is removed. It's actually the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins. The foci, where the, the foci of origin is actually the pulmonary veins. That's where it comes from. And you have just chaotic, chaotic, um, um, fo you have chaotic um, impulses going through the atrium. And that's what you see. So when they fire through the AV node, when you have rapid impulses through the AV node, you get rapid ventricular rate. Ventricular rate, the ventricular rate is the is the QRS. So this means you have a rapid ventricular rate, rapid firing. So when patients present, the first thing you want to do is control the ventricular rate. You do that by blocking the AV node. You have rapid impulses going through the AV node, so block the AV node. You're going to give AV nodal blockers. Now Synchronized cardioversion is wrong because blood pressure. What if I told you the blood pressure was 80 over 40? What would the answer be? Yeah, then the answer would be A. So if I changed the question around and told you the blood pressure was 80 over 40, that would make the answer A. So Remember, this is a synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion is the answer when the patient is unstable. Unstable cardiovert. Unstable cardiovert. Unstable cardiovert. That is very important. This patient, however, is stable. So you do not want to cardiovert a stable patient. You want to slow down the AV node, AV nodal blockers. So your AV nodal blockers are your non dihydroperidine calcium channel blockers, which include diltiazem and verapamil. Right? You can use verapamil here too. Diltiazem and verapamil. Now, you can use beta blockers, but again, the exam will not ask you dosages. The 
they will not ask you dosages, but they will ask you routes of administration. Do not give an oral medication to a patient that's in the emergency setting. This is an emergency setting. Amiodarone and brocadamide are antiarrhythmics. We do not want to give antiarrhythmics. These we spoke about. Remember, these work in the ventricle. They inhibit the ventricular action potential. We want to block AV nodal conduction. Okay, procainamide and amiodarone, they work in the ventricle, right? We do not want to give antiarrhythmics. We do not want to work in the ventricle because it's not a ventricular tachycardia. We want to slow the AV node. We want to slow AV nodal conduction, okay? We always want to start with slowing AV nodal conduction. So when you deal with AFib, you have three things to consider. Here are the three things. One, rate control, two, rhythm control, three, anticoagulation. And we're going to spend some time talking about that now. One, rate control, two, rhythm control, three, anticoagulation. When your patient walks in the door with rapid AFib, like this guy, okay, here comes a patient with rapid AFib. Call this AFib with rapid ventricular response. The guy in the question, okay, if he is not stable, he's shocked, right? If he's stable, we do rate control. First step. Then we decide. Do we continue rate control or do we use rhythm control? And that's what we're going to talk about now. Now, I told you in the question we decided to use rhythm control. So if we decide to go with rhythm control, Usually the best thing, the best way to use rhythm control is to shock. The best way to use rhythm control is to shock your cardiovert. But you can't just shock them because what's the problem with just shocking a patient with a fib? What's the big worry about cardioverting somebody with a fib? Embolic stroke, right. Embolic stroke. So therefore, if the patient's been a fib for over 48 hours, like our patient was, They've been in AFib for over 48 hours, and you decide to shock them. For whatever reason, we'll get back to the reasons later. There's a system of doing it. There's a way of doing it. You have two options. One is you can anticoagulate the patient. You can give anticoagulation for three weeks. And the answer to the question was to send the patient home with Coumadin. That's anticoagulation. Then they come back. And your cardioversion, you do a DC cardioversion. And then you send them home with anticoagulation for at least six weeks. They go back home with anticoagulation. Or the other option, this is an or, you can do one or the other. You can do a transesophageal echo right then and there to look for a clot. And if there's no clot, Cardiovert them right then and there. And that's what a lot of people do. And then they go home with anticoagulation for at least six weeks. Okay? Sometimes longer, but at least six weeks. And that's how you cardiovert. Now, we're going to talk about the dangers of this, but I just want to go over if you, if the question tells you like I did, I tell you, we decided to do rhythm control. We decided now when I say rhythm control, rhythm control means you put the patient in normal sinus rhythm. You take them from AFib, you take them from AFib, and you put them into normal sinus rhythm. We do that by shocking them. We do a DC cardioversion. When we do that, we have one of two options. Option one is we send them home with anticoagulation for three weeks. After three weeks, we do a DC cardioversion. And then we send them back home with anticoagulation. That's option one. Or option two 
is we can do a transesophageal echo. And if that shows no clot, if that's normal, we do a DC cardioversion. And then we send them home with anticoagulation. We send them home with anticoagulation. And that's option two. Transesophageal echo. Do the cardioversion right then and there. And then they go home with anticoagulation. So the question, we gave the guy diltiazem. We slowed his heart rate down. Then we decided to do rhythm control. Right? You can't just shock him. You could have done a TEE. That could have been one option. Or you could just say, go home and take Coumadin and come back in three weeks. And that was the answer. Go home on Coumadin. Come back in three weeks. We shock you. Go back home on Coumadin. What's the goal INR for Coumadin here? Two to three. Two or three. And that's how you use rhythm control. Now, a lot of times, rhythm control is tough because they go back into AFib. If that's the case, we give them antirhythms. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay? All right. Is that clear? That's how you use rhythm control. Well, that's how you do rhythm control. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and then we will continue this conversation when we get back. Okay, see you in a few minutes.
Okay, so let's go back to the slides, and here we are. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I'm still upstairs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's funny, you guys. You guys are in my home. It's pretty cool. Welcome to my home. What would you do if I was lecturing and somebody came behind me and started choking me? Wouldn't that be terrible? Like like something out of a horror movie? That'd be a really horrible thing. Right? Like I'm talking and all of a sudden somebody comes up to me. But you don't know where I am. What are you going to tell 911? I'm watching this guy somewhere in Queens. I have no idea where he is. Why do you think about that? That'd be... What is... <laughs> right? What would you tell 911? I don't know. He's in New York, he said. He's somewhere in Queens. What would you tell him? You have no idea where to tell him. Right? Wouldn't that be... Be terrible, Pete. Would you? Pete, actually, probably he would be the one to do it. <laughs> Man, there is a lot closer. That's true. Man, what a setup for a horror film. What? Hey, oh my god. Oh my god. That is freaky. Don't mess with Eddie. All right. Let's get back to AFIP. You guys are making me nervous now. Okay, so let's finish. Uh, before we get to this question. All right, so before we get to this question, let me finish. Let me go back to the whiteboard. So, let me get the whiteboard back. Okay. We spoke about rhythm control, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Um, in most patients with AFIP, like the guy in the question, we started Bill Tyazam, we got him rate control, then you have to make a decision, rhythm control or rate control. In most cases, what's the right answer? Good. Very good, guys. In most cases, rate control is the right answer. Now, when you do rate control, We'll talk more about rhythm control later. Let's focus on rate control. Now my patient's heart rate is controlled on IV diltiazem. So now I switch him to oral diltiazem, and I send him home. Or I can use oral metoprolol. Doesn't make a difference, right? Sometimes I'll need a combination of both. Now can somebody tell me what my goal heart rate is? What's the goal heart rate for these patients? That's a little too low. So, so the, the 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 newer guidelines actually that's a little too high. So one ten, less than one ten. You want to get them around eighty to one ten. That's where you want them. Eighty to one ten because you know recent studies show if you push them down to sixty to eighty, they're gonna have symptoms of bradycardia. You know, so you don't want to be too aggressive. So eighty to one ten is the goal. So that's where you want them. So that's rate control. And you can give oral diltiazem, oral metoprolol. Sometimes you need a combination. Now, let's talk about anticoagulation for a second. Does every patient with AFib need to be anticoagulated? Keep the rate control. Do the oral need anticoagulation? The answer is no. Depends on the CHADS 2 score. Talk about CHADS 2. CHADS 2. So when you have a patient with AFib, you calculate the CHADS 2 score. What does the C stand for? CHF. What does the H stand for? Hypertension. What does the A stand for? Age over what? What's the H cut off? 75. 75. Over 75. Good. D. Diabetes. S. Stroke. Or TIA. TIA counts too, guys. TIA. And they get two points, right? So, 
If your patient has a CHAT2 score of zero, we call that low in AFib. What do you do for low in AFib? Yes, Afi, good point. I'm sorry. This is for non valvular AFib. So let me let me rephrase. This is for non valvular AFib. So if you have a patient with mitral regurg or mitral stenosis, they get they get anticoagulation. That's it. Bottom line. Thank you, Safi. That's a good point. If you have mitral stenosis or mitral regurg and you have AFib, you get anticoagulated. This is for patients that have non valvular, meaning the mitral valve is normal and they have AFib. Other reasons. So if the chest two score zero, what do you do? What do we got? Aspirin. Good. Aspirin. If it's one, what do you got? Yeah, you have an option now. You can do aspirin or anticoagulation. If it's two or more, yeah, two or more, you get anticoagulation. Good. So I say anticoagulation because we now have options. So what are the options for anticoagulation? We have Coumadin, right? We can use Coumadin or what? Rivaroxa. What is Rivaroxa man? What is Rivaroxa man? How does it work? It's a factor. 10A inhibitor. We now have a Pixaban, which is also a factor 10A inhibitor. And we have the Bigatron. Which is what? What's the Bigatron? Direct trauma inhibitor. Now, it, it, it's not fair for the exam to ask you to pick which one over the other. Because we don't know. So we cannot ask you. But it is fair to ask you a couple of questions about them. So all three of them, all three of them, compared to Coumadin, all three compared to Coumadin, you see less ischemic stroke. All three of them compared to Coumadin, you see less intracranial bleeding. That's a fact. So that they can ask you. Okay. Now, for the Bigatron, you see more GI bleeding. So those are some facts that you can, they can ask you. Okay. So those are some facts. All three of them give you less ischemic stroke, less intracranial bleeding. The Bigatron gives you more... GI bleeding. So those are some facts that they can ask you. Okay. None of them, none of them need monitoring. So the nice thing why people advocate for the three new drugs, the three new drugs, the three new, and they're all oral, right? They're all oral drugs, and there's no monitoring. So the oral, no monitoring. No monitoring. Okay, so oral, no monitoring. So you may be asking me, why is everybody not using these over Coumadin? And there's a couple of reasons. One is cost. Coumadin is dirt cheap. Two is, all right, what is cost? Two is, is no, as of now, there is no antidote. So what's the antidote for Coumadin? What do you give a patient if they come in on Coumadin and they're bleeding and the INR is 15? If they're bleeding, the answer is fresh frozen plasma. If they're not bleeding, the answer is vitamin K. If they're bleeding, the answer is fresh frozen plasma. We have no antidote. So if your patients come in on these and they're bleeding, there's no antidote. That makes some people nervous. Okay, so that's the big problem. Okay, um, uh, so that's really it. There's no antidote. But otherwise, um, you know, I think you're going to see them, you know, at some point, at some point taking over Kumina, but not yet. So for the exam, there are options. So I don't think it, it, it's not fair for the exam to compare any of these agents. But any one of these is an option for patients with a CHATS2 score of one or greater. Okay? 
to prevent stroke. Okay? Right, so that's it. So what we spoke about is rate control. You're going to give Viltiazem or metoprolol. You could give DIG2, less likely, but you could give DIG also. And you're going to give one of these agents. If your CHATS2 score is, is, is one or two or higher, and if you're not low in AFib, you're going to give one of these agents for anticoagulation, and that's how you do rate control. Okay, so everybody with AFib gets an echo, right? You're going to look for valvular problems. And you're going to look for ejection fraction. Look for valvular problems, ejection fraction. Everybody with a fib is also, what's that? Um, no, without aspirin. Without aspirin. So here comes an issue that always comes up, Alexia, is what do you do if you have a patient that got a stent, a drug-eluting stent, um, and is an a fib? Now, you can give them triple therapy, which is aspirin, clopidogrel, and coumadin, and it can bleed to death. Or we do dual therapy. So what we do now is we give we give clopidogrel because without clopidogrel, if you have a stent, you're going to get instant thrombosis and die. So we give clopidogrel. And we give Coumadin because without Coumadin, you're going to have a stroke. So you want to avoid triple therapy, you see. But these patients, you don't want to give with aspirin, okay? Unless you have CAD, you can give both. But if you just have AFib, we prefer not to give with aspirin for AFib alone because the bleeding risk is too high. Okay. Okay, so that is anticoagulation for rate control. So that's how we use rate control. And most people, I would use rate control. Okay, so workup of AFib, again, echo is very important. Uh, and you're also going to want to check a TSH. Okay. Okay, let's do this question. Why is rate control a priority? Because you, you don't want to cardiovert the patient, right? Because what happens if you, what, what's the risk of cardioverting the patient when they walk in the door? Right, stroke. And you don't want to leave them in rapid AFib because what happens if you take a patient and leave them rapid? Become unstable. Become hypotensive. Right, so you, you start with rate control. You control the rate and then you make decisions. Okay, let's close the poll. And 
and the answer is B. Rapino. The answer is B. Rapino. So when you talk about the heart during systole, what's the function of the heart during systole? To pump blood, right? So how can we measure what, what what do you look at when the heart pumps? It pumps a certain volume. We call it a stroke volume. There are two things that determine that stroke volume, right? With each pump is a stroke volume. What determines your stroke volume? No, your stroke, so your cardiac output is your stroke volume times your heart rate, right? So you're so it's the other way around, right? What determines your stroke volume? Right, your cardiac output your stroke volume times your heart rate. Right? It's your preload. And the preload is your end diastolic volume. And what else? Is something else? Very good. Contractility. Contractility. Okay. So contractility. Right, so the two things that determine the volume of blood. When you when you pump that heart, when you contract, there's a certain force of contraction. Right? There's a certain force of contraction. And that force determines the volume of blood that's being ejected. That force. Right? And that force is determined by remember, the heart is a muscle, right? And just like skeletal muscle. You have actinomycin filaments, right? And when you contract your skeletal muscle, the actinomycin filaments slide past each other, right? We call this cross bridge cycling. So the force of the contraction is determined by cross bridge cycling. The force of the contraction that determines your stroke volume is determined by cross bridge cycling. The preload is a stretch on muscle before you have a contraction. So at rest, before the muscle contracts, you have a stretch. That's the preload. If you have too little preload, you have poor overlap of your actinomycin filaments. So when you stretch, you have more overlap, right? So when you stretch, you have more overlap. And when you have more overlap, you have more overlap, you have more cross bridge cycling when you go into your contraction. So preload is very important. The other thing is contractility. So now your preload is set, your red dye solid volume is set, you're done, right? The contractility, very good. Sophie, the contractility, that's the active tension. So what determines in the heart, what determines the contractility? Right? What's left? Right? When you go into muscle contraction, calcium. Good. Excellent, guys. Because what does calcium do? Calcium binds to troponin, removes tropomycin, actinomycin can touch, can bind, and you have cross bridge cycling. So the more calcium you have, the more interaction of actinomycin. You see? The more calcium, the more interaction of actinomycin, the more cross bridge cycling. Okay? Now, how do we measure contractility? What tests do we do to measure contractility? Yeah, we, what do we look for in the echo? That's where the ejection fraction comes in. The ejection fraction is a fraction. That's all it is. It's the stroke volume over the end diastolic volume. The end diastolic volume is the preload. So check this out. What the ejection fraction tells me is this. If there's a drop in my stroke volume, there's a drop in my stroke volume, that's not due to a drop in the preload. Well, it must be due to a drop in my contractility, right? Because if you're bleeding, for example, bleeding will drop the preload, right? If you're bleeding, that will drop the preload, and that will drop the stroke volume. However, if you're not bleeding, and there's not a drop in the preload, but there's a drop in the stroke volume, then what else is left? There must be a drop of contractility. So if you look at the ratio, you have a drop in the stroke volume that's not due to the preload. You have a drop in the ejection fraction. That means you have a drop in your contractility. In fact, in heart failure, the ejection, the, the end 
stock volume goes up because the RAS system, right? We spoke about the RAS system. Low cardiac output, renin secreted, aldosterone increases volume retention. And that helps because when you increase the end diastolic volume, you increase the preload and that bumps up your stroke volume. That's the correction mechanism, right? You increase your end diastolic volume, increase the preload, and that gets your stroke volume back up. That's compensation. That's how we compensate. So the end, the end of the story is rejection fraction is low. So patients with a low ejection fraction have a low contractility. So calcium, increasing calcium increases contractility. Verapamil, what does verapamil do? What does verapamil work? L-type calcium, right? It's a calcium channel block. It inhibits your L-type calcium channel in the ventricular cells. And what does it do to your intracellular calcium? Yeah, lowers it. What does that do to contractility? Yeah, so you really want to avoid rapidly in a patient with an ejection fraction of 25%, like in the question, especially when it comes in in, 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 in decompensated heart failure. Okay, so this guy needs something for rate control, right? So let's go back to the question now. This guy, he needs help. Look at him. Look let me show you. This is this is a classic question. So he comes in. He comes in. Diabetes, hypertension, systolic heart failure. He has palpitations. He's rapid, right? Jugular venous distension. He has um, he has rails on his exam. He has pitting edema. Ejection fracture twenty five percent. He's in a fib with a rapid heart rate. So he needs something for rate control. Right, but he's volume overloaded. He's in CHF. He's in decompensated heart failure. What's the best drug to give this guy? Yeah, you want to give him the jock. The joxin will lower the heart rate. How does the joxin lower the heart rate? It increases, very good, very, very good. It increases parasympathetic drive to the AV node. The joxin increases parasympathetic drive to the AV node. That's how it lowers the heart rate. It also inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase, right? When you inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase, you increase your intracellular calcium concentration, and that increases contractility. So, so the joxin, by increasing your intracellular calcium, does increase contractility, and it also increases parasympathetic drive to the heart. So it's the best agent to start with in a guy like this. Now the problem, the problem, the problem with the joxin is that it only controls the resting heart rate because it works by increasing parasympathetic drive. So when you get up to exercise and you have increased sympathetic drive to the heart, it will override the joxin. So the joxin is only good at controlling your resting heart rate. It's only good at controlling your resting heart rate. Okay? Angioedema is a very is a very um, rare side effect of lisinopril and has nothing to do with heart failure. Anybody can get angioedema from an ACE inhibitor. Anybody, okay? And has nothing to do with heart failure. In fact, we give out lisinopril. Like, in fact, if you like, I went over before. If you have systolic heart failure, if you see an ejection fraction at twenty five percent, you better get an ACE inhibitor, or you're going to prison for malpractice. You shouldn't be sued. You should be locked up. Because there's multiple studies showing that lisinopril. So basically, if you have a patient with an ejection fraction at 25%, and you're not giving them lisinopril, in my opinion, that's murder. You just murdered that patient. So you should be locked up. You can give Lasix. Lasix should be given because the guy, this guy needs Lasix. So in addition to the joxin, this patient should get the joxin, and this patient should get uh, Lasix. Absolutely. This guy should get Lasix. But what he should not get is rapamil. Yes, but where does amlodipine work? Where does amlodipine work? 
dihydropyridine periphery. So it's perfectly safe in heart failure. And yes, it causes edema, but who cares? No big deal. We give a load of pain to these patients all the time. It's not a big deal. We give it to them all the time. It's not contraindicated in heart failure. In fact, we use it in heart failure. It's used all the time. The point is, rapamil is a no-go. Now, I want to be clear on one thing. I mentioned beta blockers before. Remember, beta blockers can actually decrease contractility too, right? Um, beta blockers can decrease contractility as well, right? Because they inhibit sympathetic drive, and that decreases intracellular calcium. So, but we do give beta blockers to patients with heart failure. But the question is when. The timing is important here. It's all about timing. The guy in the question right here, I would not give a beta blocker to in this moment because he has decompensated heart failure. When patients come in with decompensated heart failure with all this volume, right? This guy has too much volume. Remember, the preload, there's an optimum preload, right? You guys ever read, um, what's that, the, the, the Goldie, Goldilocks and the Three Bears or the three, the porridge and the, I don't know. I'm not good with that. I don't have kids. You got the porridge is too cold, too hot, and just right. I don't know. I don't know anything about kids. Right, you have two, there's preloads the same way. There's too little preload. There's too much preload. And there's just the right amount of preload. What do you think this guy's preload is? On the question, what is his preload? Right, so how do we take care of this preload? And what do you just said it? I think what do you guys just said it? How do you take care of his preload? So he needs digoxin for his rate control. Yeah, you got to diurese him. So I would diurese him and get him back up on the Frank Starling curve. And once he's uvolemic, we got to give Lasix. Once he's uvolemic, then you can get beta blockers. So the point is, every patient with a low ejection fraction gets beta blockers, but the point is when. This guy in this moment does not get beta blockers because it will drop his contractility. Rapamil you should never get because there's no data that rapamil improves mortality. It just drops his contractility. So rapamil is off the table for this guy forever and ever and ever and ever. But eventually he should get carvedilol, but you have to diurese him first. Push him back. Back up on the Frank Stalin, make him feel better, and then we can give beta blockers. So symptoms first, mortality later, right? When he comes in like this, control his symptoms, make him feel better, give him Lasix, give him the... Notice I said the doxin is the last drug, not for this guy. For this guy, it's the first drug, right? Depends on your patient. This guy should get the doxin first because he needs it for rate control. Now, if the doxin fails and he's still rapid, the next thing we should do is amio. Next thing we should do is amio. Okay. All right. Actually, let's take a look at this question. Let's take a poll on this question. Okay, let's close the poll. And the answer is C, dofetilide. The answer is D, dofetilide. C, 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 dofetilide, C, dofetilide. So, now let's talk about antiarrhythmics. So, 
in patients that have low ejection fraction, in patients that have low ejection fraction, like this patient, systolic heart failure, right? There are only two antiarrhythmics that are safe. One is dofetilide, one is amiodarone, and that's it. Okay, amiodarone or dofetilide. These are the only two antiarrhythmics that are safe in patients with systolic heart failure, and that's important to know. Don't be sad, guys. It's better to get the answer, the question wrong with me than on the USMLE. Because soda law will kill this man, assassinate him. Soda law is contraindicated in heart failure. Worse than mortality. So, if you see a question where a patient has low ejection fraction, um, one A does prolong the QT interval and class three. So, let's talk about QT. So, out of the the so out of these guys, which ones will prolong the QT interval? Procainamide, right? Where's procainamide belong to? 1A. So that will. Will sodalol? What does that belong to? Where's sodalol belong? Yeah, that will prolong. Okay, so yeah, it will. So sodalol will, uh, procainamide will, will dofetilide. Where's no federal line? Yeah, three. So the federal line will too, but it's safe in low ejection fraction. So yes, the federal line will prolong the QT interval, but it is safe in low ejection fraction. So uh, remember, if, if the Tayuda QT is prolonged, you're very limited. Uh, basically, it's amiodarone. Hmm. Uh, probably amiodarone or flecainide safe too for prolonged. Flecainide is okay too for prolonged. Okay, propafenone is okay too. But for heart failure, for heart failure, it's dofetilide or amiodarone. Okay, let's summarize AFib. We went through a lot. Let's summarize. So AFib, you have atrial fibrillations. You have chaotic impulses, just rapid impulses uh, throughout the atria. So the AV node is completely removed, and you just have chaotic signaling, and they escape through the AV node, through the AV node. So you want to block the AV node, right? The treatment is here, blocking the AV node, okay? Irregular, um, normal impulses generated by the AV, uh, SA node are removed, uh, and there's disorganized electrical impulses. Uh, they originate in the H in the atria and, and eventually go to the ventricles. Uh, symptoms include uh, syncope, shortness of breath, dizziness, palpitations. Uh, anytime somebody's unstable, the answer is cardiovert. That's a high yield point. Um, we went over that. So remember, they're unstable, shock, shock, shock. Bottom line, you have to know that. Um, causes, there's many, many causes. Uh, systolic heart failure, but also diastolic due to hypertension. So hypertension is the most common cause, actually, because it causes uh, causes uh, concentric hypertrophy uh, and, and dilated and, and diastolic dysfunction. Uh, hypoxia can do it. Uh, mitral or, or, or aortic valve problems, mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation, uh, caffeine. Alcohol. Alcohol can cause AFib directly. So if they give you a young patient who comes in with palpitations, who's on a drinking binge, right? Think of alcohol. Uh, cocaine. Cocaine can do it. So alcohol can cause AFib for two reasons, because it can directly cause AFib or because it can cause a dilated cardiomyopathy, right? Remember, alcohol can cause a dilated cardiomyopathy, and that can cause AFib as well. Pericarditis surgery, digoxin paradoxically. And of course, hypothyroidism. So always check a TSH in patients with AFib. Infections too. So when patients walk in the door, the very first step, rate control with dotiazem, beta blockers, or digoxin. Anticoagulation we spoke about with the CHADS2 score. Stroke risk is high. Okay, so if they ask, rate control and anticoagulation is superior to rhythm control. Rate control with anticoagulation is superior to rhythm control. Beta blockers are actually 
the most effective class in studies. Some patients require combination. Beta blockers with this membrane only controls the resting heart rate. So as soon as they get up to walk, the heart rate will increase. Um, rhythm control is the answer. Uh, if you have a new, new onset in a young patient with lone AFib, so meaning if the heart is structurally normal, right? Let's say the patient has hypothyroidism, for example, right? Let's say the patient has hypothyroidism. If you can correct the thyroid, you can convert them back to normal sinus rhythm and leave them in normal sinus rhythm. Okay. If the, if the heart is normal, there's a good chance that they could stay in normal sinus rhythm. If you have an elderly patient with heart disease, with vascular disease, with structural abnormalities, forget it. Once you see a dilated left atrium, if the left atrium is dilated, it's not going to work. So. If you see dilated left atrium, forget it. Um, the, 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 I think the question on the exam you're going to see, and this is what, because what you, they're commonly going to ask you, is you've tried rate control, but the patient cannot tolerate the symptoms. So some patients, even though you have them on a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, they come back to you and they say, you know, I just, I just can't walk down the street. I get so short of breath. And, and, the, and, what they're going to say is decreased exercise tolerance. Decreased exercise tolerance. They cannot walk because they just can't breathe. Palpitations. So persistent palpitations, a decreased exercise tolerance, shortness of breath, persistent symptoms. Okay, that's really the big one that they'll tell you. This is the, the most common, the most important indication for rhythm control. Okay, now how do we do rhythm control? Well, the best thing to do is, is cardioversion, electrical cardioversion. Before you do that, you have two options. We spoke about this. You can do a transesophageal echo and then cardiovert them, or you could send them home with three weeks of, of anticoagulation, have them come back, cardiovert them. Either way, they go home with anticoagulation for at least six weeks. Most people will do even more than that. Now, you can use chemical cardioversion, like amiodarone, dofetiline, abutiline, propafenone, flaconide. They're all good options. All have been used for AFib. If they give you a patient that has coronary artery disease with AFib, you're limited to sodalol, amiodarone, dofetiline. This is what studies show. Now, maintenance means a lot of times you cardiovert the patient and they go back into AFib. So in most cases, again, this is a tricky game here. And again, a cardiologist will you're going to go home on one of these agents indefinitely, meaning for life. So they're going to be on these agents for forever, okay? So if they fail rate control because they have symptoms, that's when you try these agents. Now, if they fail these agents, you can do an ablation, okay? An ablation means the cardiologist does a procedure where they go in with electric cautery and they go to the pulmonary veins and they, they, they cut them, okay? They go in there and they cut the, they, they actually burn out the foci from the from the from the from the coronary veins. Now the important point is this: when you are using rhythm control, right? Even if you are giving these patients these drugs, or if you're doing an ablation, um, well, this is not WPW, but it's the same procedure, but different part of the heart, though, right? You're removing tissue from the heart to take away the the, the foci, but it's a different part of the heart. These patients still need anticoagulation. Because even though they're on these agents, they still go into AFib. Okay, so you still have to anticoagulate these patients. Even if you do an ablation, they still need to be on anticoagulation. Okay, so AFib with congestive heart failure. By congestive heart failure, I mean low ejection fraction. Okay. Low ejection fraction. How do you find the foci? Um, that's a little advanced for step two. That's that's like cardiology board. So you be they, they go and ask them where are they. They play hide to seek with them. That's a bit of, that's a bit advanced. Um, so for AFib with low ejection fraction, um, again when they come in and they're in they're in heart failure and they have a rapid and they have a rapid rate, you give them digoxin. Okay. Uh, if they fail digoxin, then you can give amiodarone. Okay. Then you can give amiodarone. 
um, be careful using beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. And never use rapamil in heart failure. Uh, you can start beta blockers for long-term management once the patient is uvolemic, right? And again, we spoke about um, you can only use for rhythm control amiodarone or dofedilac. So these are some really important points. Okay, so if we give you a patient with AFib with a low ejection fraction, use amiodarone, use dofedilac. For rhythm control, for ray control, use digoxin as first line. Rapamil is never used. Okay. Those are some important points. Okay. Let's take a poll on this question. Area choices. And I'll go back to the first slide in a minute. Okay, let's close the poll. The answer here is B, procainamide. The answer is B, procainamide. So, this is a 30 year old man, young man, comes to the ER with palpitation and dizziness for the last few hours. He had symptoms in the past but never sought medical attention. Uh, on exam, Pulse is rapid and irregular. His EKG shows a fib with a very rapid heart rate. His blood pressure is stable. His EKG from a year ago from a pre employee physical shows the following. What do you see on this EKG? Anything stick out to this to you? Very good. This patient has Wolf Parkinson White because you have a delta wave. So, in the delta wave, First thing you have to realize is you're going to see a shortened PR interval. So if you take a look down here, for example, you see the PR interval is short. And then you see this upsloping. So that is a delta wave. So the delta wave gives you the diagnosis of WPW. So this patient has WPW. Okay. Do not walk into step two without knowing what the delta wave looks like. I guarantee you, you'll be asked about a delta wave. So, let's get a closer look. Again, this is another EKG with a delta wave. And I just want you to, you know, get a, get a, you know, it may be hard to see here, but you, you have to look on your own. Get a closer look and make sure you can see what it looks like. Here's a, here's a closer look here. This is, this is what it looks like. So here's your P wave, okay, and that upsloping. 
All right, here's your P wave, and you see that upsloping? That's a delta wave. Okay, so there's your P wave, and you see that upsloping? That's a delta wave. Okay. Now, when a patient with WPW goes into AFib, you're going to see a Y complex. So this is this is a patient with WPW in AFib. So you're seeing a Y complex. We call this AFib with aberrancy. Now, how do you know it's AFib? So how do you know this is AFib? It's you see there's your delta wave, there's your delta wave, there's your delta wave. How do you know the patient's in AFib? What on this on this rhythm strip tells you the patient's in AFib? It's irregular. Look, look at that from that R wave to that R wave to that R wave. It is irregular. So this is an irregular rhythm. Can you guys see that? Can you see that it's irregular? Can you see that? So this is irregular. So this is a fib, but you see the delta wave. Okay, so this is irregular with the delta wave. Okay, so you should be able to recognize this. This is a patient with WPW that goes in AFib. It's irregularly irregular, and you could still see the delta wave. Okay, so that's what it looks like when they go in AFib. That's the delta wave. This is the resting EKG, right? This is not a patient in AFib, but you still see the delta wave. This is WPW. Now let's talk about why, why WPW occurs. Here's your normal heart. Here's your SA node, right? Impulse goes down the atria through the AV node, down the bundle of his for kidney fibers, normal conduction. And WPW had this accessory pathway. Okay. Now what can happen is is you can get in you can get a reentry tachycardia, right? You can get an atrial ventricular reentry tachycardia, AVRT, atrial ventricular reentry tachycardia. So this is a reentry tachycardia. Now Earlier today, we spoke about SVT, which was a reentry tachycardia within the AV node. So that's a reentry tachycardia within the AV node. In that case, you want to give AV nodal blockers because the problem is in the AV node. So you want to go after the AV node. Here, you have a reentry tachycardia that's outside of the AV node. Here, you have a reentry tachycardia that's outside of the AV node. So if this patient comes in with a rapid heart rate and you give this patient an AV blocker like a beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker, or digoxin, or if you give this patient adenosine, that will only work in the AV node. The AV nodal blockers, like beta blockers, like calcium channel blockers, like adenosine, like, like digoxin, they will not block conduction through the accessory pathway. They only work in the AV node. So you will continue to conduct through this accessory pathway. You will continue to conduct through the accessory pathway. And you will put this patient into a ventricular fibrillation. So this is this is a high yield point that you will be tested on. When patients have WPW and they come in with atrial fibrillation, you have to give an antiarrhythmic. Doesn't matter which one, probably going to be procainamide. That's the most common one that is used. But it is contraindicated. It is an absolute contraindication to give an AV nodal blocker. So, to summarize, WPW is caused by an accessory pathway known as the bundle of kin. They can come in with any anything SVTs, AFib. As always, if they're unstable, you shock. We know that, right? If they're unstable, we shock. If they're stable, we commonly, the answer is, if they're stable, procainamide, 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 procainamide. That's the answer, procainamide. Avoid digoxin, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. They will inhibit conduction through the normal pathway. They will block the AV node, and that will increase the likelihood of a ventricular tachycardia because it will not block conduction through the accessory pathway, okay? You'll block the AV node, and, and it actually will potentiate conduction through the bundle of kin because the, the impulse is nowhere else to go, right? So, uh, again, you can use anyone. 
I said for canamide, but you can use amiodarone. Uh, you can use bucanamide, flecainide, propafenone. You can use anything. Okay, anyone is fine, but don't use these agents. I cannot tell you how important this is. I guarantee you will see this. This is so high yield. All right, you'll see this throughout your life. Ablation, somebody mentioned before, you know, this is the emergency setting, but definitive treatment is you go in there and you burn away the bundle of Kent. You go in there with, with, the, with, the, with the cauterize it, you burn away the bundle of Kent, and, and it's cured. Okay, thank you, Giannis. Thank you. You fry it off. Thank you. Okay. My sister had WPW when she was 13. She's 25 now. And uh, I remember she always went to arrhythmias and um, she always went to the emergency room. And then she had an ablation done at, at uh, Columbia and she's, she's been fine. 13 years later, she's been fine. So I actually learned about WPW before I went to medical school. I, didn't know I, I was still in college, so I didn't even know what it was. But she's, uh, she got an ablation and it's fine. You know, WPW was in the cardiology section. I just put it in my section because I'm a nerd. But this is this is in the cardiology section. <laughs> this is this is the cardiology section. Okay, so um, I'm not done with the cardiology section, but, you know, um, tomorrow night we have, um, we'll have plenty of time. So let's, let's finish up for tonight. Tomorrow night we'll finish the cardiology section and we'll finish all of emergency medicine. Okay. So I hope you had as much fun as I did. Arrhythmias is a lot of fun. Thanks, Mohammed. Thank you very much. Sylvia had fun. Jose, everybody had fun. Eric, cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I hope you guys had as much fun as I did. You're welcome, Dan Brown. You're all welcome. Kavita, my emergency room physician. We have to talk about this. We'll talk more tomorrow. We will talk more tomorrow about your career choice. I'm not a big fan of emergency medicine doctors. I'll tell you tomorrow more. No, I don't like them. I'll tell you why. You've heard many stories. I'll tell you some more tomorrow. I'll tell you some more. Okay. <laughs> You'll like them. I'll give you some good stories tomorrow. All right, Amanda, thank you very much. Mark, you're the man. Thank you for everything. Thanks for your help. As always, thank you. Who's with me tomorrow? Mark, Amanda. Amanda's not with me. Mark, you with me? We've had enough. Can't look at the shiny head anymore. Just can't take it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, good night, everybody. I will see you tomorrow night. Oh, your dad has a shiny head, too? <laughs> we'll get along, man. Old bull guys get along. <laughs> okay, good night, everybody. See you tomorrow. It was a great class. We'll have another great class tomorrow night. Enjoy. Good night, Mark. Good night, Amanda. Thanks again. Thanks for everything.